I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 13th, 2020. May I have a roll call, please? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Here. Mayor Fair? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Doug Stewart, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? May I have a pro an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. I'll second. Ma Mayor Fair, we need to remove item 3A1. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda, removing item 3A1. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, on to uh, the approval of the agenda, removing item 3A1. Okay, thank you. May I please have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on January 2nd, 2020, with the amended agenda posted on January 10th, 2020. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, the presenter of the um, presentation is apparently stuck in the accident on Pacific Coast Highway, so we will put that item on when they arrive. All right. Uh, may we please have a staff update on disaster response and recovery? Good evening, Mayor and Council. So, um, it's been a while since we've been here. Since the time um, we've uh, kicked off the Wildfire Protection Plan project, uh, coming up soon will be a community survey, survey that will be issued probably in early February to start collecting information and data from the community and also to get information and feedback from the community. There will be two community workshops scheduled in February. Uh, those are both the same workshops. So you can go to either one. It's just two opportunities, a week nine and a weekend, so that depending on how it works for people's schedule. Also, we uh, built a new web page, a new wildfire fire safety web page, trying to make it easier for people to get this information. Jerry also, since his last name is kind of a tough one to spell, he established a new email so people can hopefully remember fire safety at malibucity.org. <laughs> um, but that'll be great to have going forward, no matter you know who's in that position. It just makes a lot of sense. And also for uh, the home ignition zone assessment, we now have on the web page, and you can see it up there, a little button where you just book an appointment. It'll just make it easier for people to book an appointment rather than having to go back and forth with emails with uh, Jerry. So we're uh, really happy we have that up and running. The evacuation plan, uh, the one thing that's changed is we met with the consultant who did the traffic study for us and they provided us all the data and their recommendations for evacuation. So that is being um, put into the draft plan that we had based on our working groups. And again, this is still on schedule to be brought to the Disaster Council on January 30th and presented to the City Council February 24th. Our siren study, sound study, the kickoff meeting is this week. Um, that will be just a meeting with the consultant to kind of lay out the project plan, um, how it's gonna move forward. The study is expected to be complete by June, and at that time the results would be presented to the city council. And essentially what this is doing is looking at our uh, geography, figuring out what will be the best location for sirens, the types of sirens, and that kind of thing to make sure we have full coverage in the community. 
And as always, we encourage everyone to sign up for disaster notifications and alerts at malibucity.org slash news or malibucity.org slash disaster notifications and the city hotline 310-456-9982 or one call to city hall 310-456-city. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I'd like to give you an update on where we are with the replacement structures. To date, the planning department has approved 210 single family residences to be rebuilt. And this is just a quick breakdown of what those, uh, th those homes are like, the, how it's composed uh, the 210. Uh, 61 of the homes are like for like rebuilds and 136 of the homes are like for like rebuilds where folks did up to a 10% addition and 13 of the 210 are where there was some sort of change to the home, uh, whether it be square footage beyond the 10% or height above 10% and then also perhaps a reciting. So it's not necessarily that much larger of a home, but it is something different. While I understand this is a bit hard to read, uh, what we're trying to show here is the trend of how many applications we're seeing come through the doors. The tallest number there, the lighter blue, those are applications for like for like rebuilds with uh, no more than a 10% addition. And so far our submittal numbers have stayed uh, somewhat steady the last few months. They have dropped from the peak that we had at the beginning of summer. Uh, but for right now, we're seeing on average about close to 20 applications a month for like for like rebuilds. And the other numbers that are staying relatively consistent are say additions to those homes. Uh, we're seeing about maybe 10 applications a month where someone's doing a smaller addition or perhaps uh, building a, a shed or a, a replacement garage, something separate. To date, we've implemented just over $1.8 million worth of fees that have been waived. This is once again is uh, all, are all the fees that are associated with the rebuild. So that's planning fees, building and safety, the public works reviews, as well as geology and environmental health. Good evening, council members. Uh, as a building and safety, um, we have the great news to announce to the community that the first home has been completed. And that's and the second home is about two weeks away from giving uh, certificates of occupancy. So that is wonderful news to start the year. We have also have seen an increase of applications submitted. Uh, the month of November, we got 21 uh, permits submitted for the rebuild. Uh, we have uh, also experience that the, during the month of December we received 51. So we're hoping that this trend continue moving forward. We have given approval to 49 homes um, and 91 right now under plan check review. So great news to start the year and we look forward to seeing a lot more construction going on and a lot more uh, homes to be completed this year. And that's all we have. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Richard. I have a quick question. So are, is Malibu the only town in the state of California to waive all these fees that are involved in the rebuilding process? Uh, yes, good evening. Um, the state of California have uh, experienced several wildfires in the community of Malibu, um, is the only community in the state of California that has granted to the community a uh, waiving of fees. Thank you very much, Yolanda, and thank you and all of your staff members for all your hard work and helping everybody rebuild. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, for public comments, our uh, first speaker will be uh, Sergeant Jim Braden from LA County Sheriff uh, to give us a report. Welcome, Sergeant Braden. Good evening, and uh, if you don't know me, I'm Sergeant Jim Braden. I work at a Lost Hill station. 
I have about 20 years experience. I've been on the Sheriff's Department almost 30 years, but I have about 20 years experience in the city of Malibu, working all different capacity jobs. My current job, I work as a watch commander at Lost Hill Station, and I've done, the last several years, I've done the summer enforcement team down on the beach also. Uh, my report tonight to you is on the crime stats, which would be versus 2018 and 19. So in the year 2019, it shows a 12.7% increase. And this was reported in the uh, Malibu Times. And um, what I came tonight is to explain some of this or put a face on it. So it, it, it's not to minimize it, but it's to show where the upticks are and what's going on. So to get started, um, I'm gonna address the areas that basically went up, which was, one was robberies. And in the year 2018, there was four different robberies. In the year 2019, there was 11. Now out of these, to explain what they are, um, there was eight of them that were actually STs, 211s, which basically started out probably someone shoplifting something and it escalated into a robbery when the person used force or fear when maybe a security guard or someone tried to stop him from leaving the location. So that's part of that uptick. There was two bank robberies in the city last year. Now out of those bank robberies, both suspects were arrested. Out of the total number of robberies in Malibu, eight of the people were arrested. Um, the other robberies, there was some, one was in the beach area down by Zuma, which was someone was approached with a gun in their car and told to give their wallet and give their phone. Um, so as far as the robberies go, that's kind of just putting a face on, on what those are. Um, the other areas of concern um, are in the, well, I'll start with the vehicles. So lock vehicle burglaries in 2018 was 119. In 2019, it was 156. So it went up 37. Um, Percentage-wise, that's in the close to 30% range that it went up. Now there's a couple different possibilities here. One, LAPD also experienced a 30% uptick and it wasn't in all their areas, it was in more of the affluent areas. And what they're finding is there's different gangs, even from Northern California, renting cars coming down. And basically they're targeting rental cars and in these affluent areas because they know they have property in the car. Um, now, our West Hollywood station experienced a massive increase and it is related to tourists being targeted they had 2,000 vehicle break-ins last year. So, in my mind, we're not experiencing as much as that, but there's a couple different factors that played into that. One last summer, between the city and the county of Los Angeles, Sheila Kuehl's office, we were able to field extra deputies in the peak part of the year, and it, they used it for a traffic enforcement team, but it, it Using them, along with the beach team you paid for, along with regular patrol, and also the volunteer patrol, had, I believe, a positive impact on that, that we would have been affected even more. Because this is an affluent community. We have thousands of visitors that come here. Um, one other factor is from about November 9th on, Malibu in the year 2018 was highly affected by one of the most disastrous fires that's ever hit Malibu. Um, during that time, it had a positive impact on crime because there's several hundred deputies in Malibu for several weeks. Um, so the normal crime that you would experience during that time, had we not had the Woolsey fire, there wouldn't be as much of a percentage difference. So I don't, I personally, I don't think the gang thing, I think with the units we fielded last year in the peak part of the year when we have the most tourists, I think it had a positive impact on Malibu. Um, 
Another area that went up uh, was, uh, they'll call it a, a burglary, but it's of an outbuilding. Now, I know this as being the watch commander at Lost Hills. After the Woolsey fire, there's a lot of opportunists that come down that think because the property's burned out that they have the right to come on the property and take different items. There were several arrests made for these things, but the, the, the comparison between um, 2018 and 2019. In 2018, there were seven of these. In 2019, there were 17. Um, we'll also have to address in the coming months, as there's more and more construction, uh, high visibility patrols, especially when these houses get their fixtures put in them and the expensive uh, things, people like to come in and, and take them. So we're going to experience that also. So somehow we'll have to roundtable that and address it. Um, what else? Somewhat of an increase in, in petty thefts, which is basically someone going into CVS or somewhere else and deciding they're going to take items or the gas station over here. Um, what else? Arson, there was a slight uptick, but that can be in a positive way, too. There was three different arsonists arrested versus one in the year 2018. So for different, different situations that occurred. Um, also, domestic violence, which we don't have as much of an effect on. It's more of a situation that happens that we respond to, which there was basically felony domestic violence. There was zero in 2018, and there was three in the year 2019. So um, I'm open for any questions, or? Thank you, Sergeant Braden. Questions, anybody? Thank you for your report, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that article that LAPD put out was in the LA Times as well, and it identified everything that you said uh, on the gangs coming down for opportunities here. Yeah, and I think uh, if people haven't read that, the LA Times did carry it last week in the paper. It's an interesting article, and I, I really think it means that we need to really, when we have the massive amount of tourists into Malibu, I think last year was it was handled in a positive fashion to where we had more patrol out there. And it affect traffic positively because the, the sole mission of those cars was to address things. They had little sections that they were in and they were to address things and expedite things to keep the roadway clear and open and open as quick as possible when an event occurred. So. And I know that, uh, I don't know much about it, I wasn't part of it, but some Arson Watch members were helping out as lookouts, and maybe we should look at that continuing for next I, I didn't mention them. Yes, the yes. Arson Watch also. That has a positive impact. All right. Thank you so much, Sergeant Thank Braden. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, three speaker slips under <laughs> item 2A. Uh, if you would please uh, be ready to speak so we don't lose time in between. Jim Reed, followed by Craig Hill, followed by Lloyd Ahern. Mr. Reed? Okay. All right. Craig Hill, followed by Lloyd Ahern. Good evening, Council. Um, there are three systemic things related to fire prevention that you folks have no jurisdiction over, but you can encourage and coordinate among state agencies and utilities. And I, I, wanted, I want to hear from you about these three things. I think the community would like to hear from you on an ongoing basis about what's being done about them. One, we've talked about it before, the disjuncture between the sheriff saying zero tolerance, everybody has to evacuate on the one hand, and on the other hand, the lesson we're learning, you wanna stay and fight the fire, and, and uh, that's one problem. Problem two is the water pumps in the canyons need backup power. Without backup power, we don't have water to fight fires. And that's something that Big Rock has been working on. We've got waterworks on board to maintain 
the backup generators that would be required. Um, Edison is on board, but all of Malibu needs something more systematic to address that. And the third one is telecoms. We had more robust phone systems 50 years ago when it was all copper. And as we just saw in Australia, as we're seeing, the, the remote cell towers that, ha that they drag around, that we've had a few here, have backup power for about eight hours, and then they need, the generator needs refueling. They couldn't get in to refuel them, a lot of them. A lot of them burned up in fires. I talked to Susan Duanius last week, and she said, well, the cell companies would like to put in some of the bigger, I don't know, the macro size towers, the kind that are, that are disguised as trees or something that have more robust backup capability, but there's no land to put those on. There's no place to situate those. So to, to summarize, we've got the evacuation thing, we've got the water pumps, and we've got the telecoms. What are we doing about that? And I, it's not your responsibility directly, but I think you can help coordinate and at least be keeping the community up to date on, on uh, what is or isn't happening in those three regards. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Next is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Ryan Embry. Uh, good evening. Uh, there's going to be a scoping meeting for new uh, coastal access ways on January 22nd at King Gillette Ranch. And uh, I, Bonnie Blue uh, assured me that there was going to be someone from the planning department, which is great because Jessica Calvert was at the last scoping meeting uh, for Porco Canyon, and we know the result of that. We won. So I want to read to you what I sent to you guys today. Uh, it's out of the Malibu Times. The MCR, MRCA has filed plans to reconstruct 10 existing um, beach axeways and build seven new ones in Malibu. Okay. They want seven new uh, access ways. First, let's make them redo the 10 that they have right now, meaning they don't enforce the dog, so we know what the dogs do on the, on the sand, and that goes into the ocean. The Coastal Commission talks about the environment out of one side of their mouth and has literally no enforcement on the beach. There's no trash. There's, you know all the problems. So that's our, that's our leverage. Um, Malibu is needs a, seven new access ways like it needs five left legs. We've got enough problems with people stopping right in the middle of PCH trying to look for a place. They're tourists. It's, you know, that's not their fault, but they don't know what they're doing and everybody's affected by it. So what I'm, I've talked to Trevor today, and we missed a couple of times on things, but he'll explain to you the laws of wh what's going on. They're going to try to bypass going through Malibu, and they're going to go just right straight to the Coastal Commission and tell our planning department and everybody else to take a hike. So we have got to be on the aggressive right now, and I got 57 seconds, so I just want to say back to the thing that I talk, talk about all the time. Let's get them to enforce the rules on the 10 that we have now. Joe's got 12 hot dogs in his mouth right now, and he's passing a note saying, I want 16 more hot dogs. Imagine that. Visualize that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Our, our next speaker is Ryan Embry. Yeah, and, and you can tell Joe, ask him if he'd like fries with that. Um, I'm, I'm here to ask you about the um, mobile uh, cellular unit that's taking up the six parking spaces in underneath the uh, uh, city manager's office window. I'm so happy it's here. I don't know if that's the most ideal place for it to be because it's not operating. It was also here October 30th and 31st uh, when the long-term power outage occurred to Point Doom and parts like Escondido Beach when it would have been a perfect time to call up, I think it's Verizon, whose frequencies that runs off of. If you walk around it, you can read the stickers. Um, that this is a subcontractor's vehicle probably for Verizon and should have been deployed and parked maybe on the city's Heathercliff lot um, to 
fulfill the communications needs of the residents of Point Doom who were without power and could not easily communicate or had um, compromised ability to communicate. And also to note that a lot of smartphones can operate as a Wi-Fi hotspot and use the data off the cellular plan. And that can help people use their laptops at home and get their email and get a little bit of work done. So I'm not so sure about the disconnect of how that wonderful piece of equipment that looks absolutely brand new and probably cost half a million dollars was just let there to sit during that two or three day power outage when it would have been a perfect demonstration project for uh, that carrier to see how fast it takes for them to get a driver down here and to reposition that where needed and turn it on and have it work. So I keep that in mind, or if it's not going to be used, maybe it could go in the back parking lot up where the emergency supplies are, um, the container, the mobile EOC, and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, now we are going to back up in the agenda. Uh, I hear that Jeff Klein is here from the county to make a presentation for item 1A. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor Farr, and uh, thank you to the council uh, for having me here tonight to talk about our new voting system and all the changes to the elections for the March primary election. Uh, the project is called Voting Solutions for All People. We call it VSAP for short. And uh, there's a number of different changes to what we call the voter experience. Um, the purpose of me being here today is not only to educate the council and also the residents of Malibu about the changes, but also make our office available should anyone uh, want any presentations or more information about the changes for their organizations or uh, various portions of the community. Uh, I did bring some of the little yellow booklets that you see on the screen. They're available that provides a summary of all the different changes. Um, but I'll go quickly through all the different changes and then if there's any questions, happy to address any uh, concerns or questions that you might have. Um, so we call it a new voter experience. It's a number of different components. It's not just a new voting system. It's not just a new voting device, uh, but there's a number of components. So the first one that we have is the electronic poll book, and this replaces the paper roster that you see normally when uh, you show up to check in. Uh, the reason we have the electronic poll book is that under the new model, voters can go to any vote center in LA County. They're not assigned to a polling place. So the electronic poll book allows us to tap into the voter database and look that voter up to maintain the integrity of the election and produce that voter's ballot. It is a paper ballot, so we need to be able to look up what precinct that voter is registered to. Also with the electronic poll book, we can uh, implement uh, conditional voter registration. And what that is, it allows voters to register up to and on election day. So anything you can do with the voter registration process, first time registrants, uh, change address, change political party, you can do that up to and on election day. Previously, that service was only available at our office in Norwalk, so it wasn't very convenient for voters. Uh, there's a few other things we can do with electronic poll books. If a voter is a vote by mail voter uh, and they haven't returned their vote by mail ballot, we can cancel their vote by mail ballot on the spot and issue them a normal ballot, which is an improvement because in the past, voters always had to use the provisional process. So that's a, another a really great improvement for voters. Uh, moving on, we have a new modern tally system. This is a little more on the administrative side, but it allow us to more efficiently uh, process the election and tally the election. Uh, it's, it is a paper ballot, so it is still tallied off of the paper, uh, but the modern tally system also allows us to improve how we might do recounts or audits, and I know for people who are candidates and involved in running for office, that's something that's of interest. Uh, for the interactive sample ballot, which is the third bubble, uh, it is a new service we're offering. It's an optional service. So currently everyone receives their paper sample ballot, and I think that's something everyone is familiar with. It lists who you're eligible to vote for. Under the interactive sample ballot, you can actually get an electronic version of your booklet on your mobile device or your home computer. You can make all your selections in advance, and it generates a, a barcode that looks like a fancy boarding pass. You would take that into the vote center, you scan it, and it would instantly transfer your selections. It's just an expedited process. It doesn't, it's not your vote. You still have to review, print, and cast your ballot, 
but the interactive sample ballot, or we call it the ISB for short, is an expedited process, so someone could be in and out of the vote center in maybe five or six minutes, uh, so it, it really speeds up the process for voters who want to take advantage of that. Uh, moving on the ballot marking device, and you can see a picture of it from the top down. I don't know if anyone's had an opportunity to try it. We've had demo centers throughout the county. We did a mock election where voters were able to try the ballot marking device. Uh, but it is one device that brings all the components that we've had in the past for voting systems to one device. Uh, the important part about the ballot marking device, it's still a paper ballot as mentioned. There's also no internet, no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, so a lot of people are concerned about hacking and tampering. Uh, there, it's not possible because it just has a power cord. Uh, you put your paper ballot inside and then it prints onto the paper directly and that's what we use to count the, the election. Uh, there is a ballot box attached to it, so when you cast your ballot, it goes back into the device and deposits into the ballot box. The touch screen, has all the, uh, has not just the English ballot, but it'll bring up a ballot in any language that voters speak in LA County if we serve that. So there are 12 languages outside of English that we serve voters in. And there's an audio component available where you could hear your language either in English or in any of those languages. Um, moving on, the voting period and the vote centers, this is probably the most significant change to how people will vote in LA County. Starting this year, voters will have 11 days where they're able to cast their ballot, not just one day. So if you want to vote on election day, you're perfectly welcome to, and that's what some voters might still do because they feel it's traditional and so forth. But voting will open February 22nd. We'll have 250 vote centers starting those 10 days before the election. And then the last four days of the election, which is the Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and election day, you'll have 1,000 vote centers, and voters can go to any of those vote centers. Uh, one, one common comment we hear a lot is people ask, well, how many polling places did you have? And we say 4,500 for a general, normal election. So people say, well, 4,500 versus 1,000, is that really more convenient? But it actually is because with the 4,500, you could only use one location on one specific day. Now you have up to 1,000 locations over an 11-day period. If you want to vote you know, uh, by your work, if you want to go to your family or your friends and they live in a different area, you can all go to vote together at a vote center. A lot more options and a lot more convenience. Uh, the last bubble is the vote by mail experience. Uh, in 2018, we actually rolled out a new vote by mail ballot, so that's not entirely new for this year. Uh, what is new, we'll have a lot more drop boxes available. Uh, we'll have up to 250 drop boxes available around LA County. Voters will have three ways in which they can return their ballot, either by drop box, they can return it by mail and it's all postage paid now, or they can walk it into a, any of the 1,000 vote centers. So I have a video that I'll play really quick and, it'll, and then I'll get into a few more details. Oh, I think we have to click of the... The election is just around the corner, and Los Angeles County has a new way for voters to make their voices heard. New Los Angeles County Vote Centers are located throughout the county. Cast your ballot near your home, work, or favorite park. Voters can go anywhere. To find a vote center that's convenient, visit lavote.net and find one that works best for you. Instead of waiting for one day to vote, you are now able to vote across 11 days. Once you've arrived, a vote center assistant will greet you and check you in before taking you to the ballot marking device. Did you know that there is a new interactive sample ballot that lets you pre-mark your selections online and generate a poll pass? A unique QR code that will let you quickly transfer, review, and cast your selections on a paper ballot at the County Vote Center. The new ballot marking device includes an audio ballot, a touch screen, and a tactile keypad to make voting faster and more accessible. You can also select your language, change the font size, and adjust the contrast for easy viewing. Then, after you make your selections or scan your poll pass, you can review your ballot to verify your choices and cast your ballot by feeding the paper ballot back into the ballot marking device. There's no need to give your ballot to a vote center assistant. You cast it on the same device. Welcome to the future of voting in Los Angeles County. Fast, convenient, and easy. 
go to vsap.lavote.net to exercise your right to vote and let your voice be heard. All right, so that's an overview of what I just explained and for anyone who would like these videos, it's all available and we're happy to provide it. Uh, we have additional resource materials as well. Just to go into uh, vote by mail a little bit more, that's what the vote by mail ballot looks like. So voters now mark directly onto the vote by mail ballot. Whereas in the past you had the little Scantron card and you had to transfer the number from the booklet onto the Scantron card and we found that led to some errors by voters. This is a lot more straightforward and a lot more intuitive. Uh, we also, we, as mentioned, we'll have drop box locations where voters can come and drop off their ballot. You can mail it postage paid or you can walk it into a vote center. So if you are a vote by mail voter, nothing will really change as in except for more options to return your ballot. But permanent vote by mail voters will still get their ballot and you can still request one as well. For vote centers, on the left is a picture of the typical vote center layout. That would be what we would consider a large vote center. Large vote centers will have up to 50 ballot marking devices. The medium will have about 25 to 30 ballot marking devices. And the small will have 10 to 15 ballot marking devices. We're trying to strategically place them around LA County uh, to get maximum usage for areas that need high volume foot traffic. That's where the large will be and, and so forth. Uh, in the middle are some of the main talking points we want to really emphasize. You can go to any vote center in LA County. Uh, you, the the e-poll book or electronic poll book, electronic roster, some people refer to it as, we'll be able to look voters up in real time and we'll also mark them as voted as, in real time. And this prevents someone from maybe going from one vote center to the other and trying to vote multiple times. Uh, it's, everything is fully accessible, not just the ballot marking device but also the facility accessibility is a big feature that we take into account. And on the right is the electronic poll book. As you can see, it looks very similar to an, an, a tablet. Um, and that's how we'll look voters up. And the lookup process will continue just as it has under the old model. Data has been one of the big uh, components of this project. It's actually been a 10 year project. We started in 2009. Uh, and lately, we've done some data on voter behavior. Uh, recently, we asked voters why they didn't vote. So a number of the re reasons, and I don't think these are going to be a surprise to anybody, but the number one reason is people said they were too busy on election day. Well, and the next one was the election wasn't important. Then as you go down the list, they forgot about the election, unable to get time off of work. They were suddenly going out of town, and so on and so forth. So most of these reasons, in fact, all except how important the election is, all of those other reasons will go away under our new model because now you have more options. If you're leaving work late one night, you can vote at the vote center by your work or you can take care of it on the weekend or while you're out running errands. So a lot more options and we hope this leads to higher turnout, which I think is something everybody really wants. Um, on the right are locations where people said that they like vote centers and it's gonna be the typical locations, a library, school, recreation center. And usually when you ask someone where would you like to vote, people will think back to where they had the best voter experience. But over time, some of these locations may start changing and you might see some unconventional locations like shopping malls and things like that. Uh, the vote center model is based on what they do in Colorado and Nevada. In those states, they've had vote centers for a while and they do use some of these unconventional locations. And that's something that we'll be exploring as elections continue throughout LA County. But for now, it's gonna be mostly the traditional locations. The interactive sample ballot, as I mentioned, it's an optional service. Again, you make your selections on your mobile device or on your computer and, and uh, it'll generate this poll pass. It looks like a boarding pass, has a QR code on it. When you check in and you get your ballot, you'll scan it and it transfers your selections. Uh, I like to always emphasize again, it's not your vote. If you lose it, there's no personal information on it. You can reprint one or you don't have to use it. Uh, no one can see who you are. It's just like an electronic version of your booklet, no personal information. Okay, the ballot marking device, I mentioned a little bit about it earlier. As you can see on the left there, there's a ballot box on the back. So when someone votes, the ballot will go straight into that ballot box. We actually recently presented to the California Council of the Blind and I think it's a great uh, story to tell because it was the first time ever in the history of voting systems that someone who was blind was able to vote a completely independent ballot. That means make all the selections without telling anyone their selections and they didn't have to give their ballot to anyone. So it's really improving the voter experience. 
Uh, the picture in the middle shows the legs are wider. Someone in a wheelchair can get up close to the ballot marking device and they can use it. And then on the right, you could see the, ballot, the paper ballot sticking outside of it. Uh, it's a very intuitive device. During our mock election, anyone could come out and participate. Uh, if you were a five-year-old, you could use it. And if you were at the opposite end of the age spectrum, I promised that person I wouldn't reveal her age. So you can, you can use it. So I, we like to show this because it's, it's how intuitive this device is. Uh, and it's been focus tested with over 5,000 individuals, and that's how the design really evolved. Also, if you need any of the accessibility services, you can just use it. You don't have to tell anyone if you have a disability or whatnot. Um, so on the left there, you can see someone using the audio feature. In the middle, someone may be using the disability, uh, one of the accessibility services or may not. And on the right, someone who's in a wheelchair can get up close and use it as well. Okay, the final slide, and then I can take a few questions. Uh, the, this is the flow chart for voting. And I like this slide because a lot of times people say, well, you're changing so much, how are we gonna really know what to do anymore? But really the process for voting isn't changing, just how we interact with that process is changing. So what I mean by that is step one, you have to arrive at a vote center just like you arrive at a polling place. Step two, there's an electronic poll book. There'll be a, uh, a worker there to check you in, just like right now, it's just an electronic uh, tablet instead of the paper booklet. Step three is you insert your paper ballot that you receive at check-in. Step four, or sorry, you receive your paper ballot. Step four, you insert that paper ballot. Step five, you make your selections. Either you have the poll pass or you make the selections by hand. Step six, you gotta review, print, and then cast your ballot. And step seven, you get your I voted sticker after you voted. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy, pretty streamlined. Um, so I have a few more slides on just partnerships and how we can help all work together to get the word out, but any questions on the process or the equipment? Uh, looks, looks Jeff, fantastic. thank you so much. Sure. Um, I know the library's doing demonstrations. Nice. Uh, they're Monday through Thursday through the end of the month, and I know uh, Monday through Wednesday, I don't know the exact hours. The Thursday hours are a little bit different. Yeah, Do you know I'd have to, I don't have it in front of me, but I could find out. We'll, we'll definitely, I could look it up as soon as I'm done here. I could, we have a, a flyer on our website. Okay, thank yeah. you. We have flyers uh, probably, I think, upstairs and okay. downstairs here as well, and we've been sending out notices. Oh, great. great. Yeah. Okay, All right, thank, thank you for you. hosting that. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Questions? Briefly, uh, I imagine you had a chance to see the 60 Minutes expose on... Uh, voter uh, crashing in the uh, internet? Did you to see uh, that? I didn't see that one. Right now my life is all VSAP, so, okay. so I'm, I didn't, but uh, I'm sure there's a lot of you know, concern around uh, you know, voter issues, elections, and so yeah. forth. They had mentioned the uh, interactive selection process as well as that would be a weakness, so just letting you know if you watch that 60 Minutes, it, okay. it, it will help you out. We don't have to tell everybody here and take the whole evening, but it was a great expose. Okay. Uh, yeah, the one thing I do want to mention about it, and I didn't see that one specifically, but there are concerns people raise. Um, it, the one thing to know about the interactive sample ballot, it doesn't save your personal information on your device or anything like that. It's not an app you have to download. You, uh, it'll take you to a link on our website that brings up that electronic version. So there have been some steps made to make, ensure um, you know, it's secure and, and it has a high level of integrity, but I'll check out that, that, up, that uh, program as well. Okay, thank you great. so much. Can I just actually point out a couple of things? Of course. I... Okay, great. I... Okay, so I, I just wanted to talk really quick about some of our partnerships and how that's been working and maybe that's you know something we can explore as we're getting close to the election. Um, we did do a lot of VCPP meetings, Vote Center Placement Project meetings, and those meetings uh, allowed us to help select locations around the county for vote centers. Uh, we had our mock election as mentioned. We got a lot of really positive feedback and user interface. And also we have our, our uh, EAP, our election administration plan up on our website right now. And that is if someone is interested in learning more about the administration side of all of it, what is our outreach plan, what is our uh, media plan, what's our contingency plan, a lot of other information. I wanna make sure everyone knows that that is available and, and uh, it's been submitted to the Secretary of State. We're just awaiting approval. Um, We've done a lot of VSAP presentations, as mentioned, presentations like this one, so I appreciate uh, having us come out, having me come out and present to get the word out to people of Malibu. Um, and we also have the demo centers, as mentioned. 
Uh, the last thing I just wanted to give everyone a sense of what we're doing for full implementation. Uh, currently, we're doing a massive media blitz. People might start hearing about VSAP. Last week is when our media blitz really started rolling out. Um, it's the largest media campaign we've ever done, uh, one of the largest the county has ever done. Uh, we want to encourage everyone to spread the word because even if, even with our media plan, we have to reach 10 million folks around LA County, so we can't really do this ourselves, so it's really important. And we view the cities as playing a very strong role, an important role in getting that information out. So I thank you uh, again for the demo center for having me come out here. And just as a reminder, I just want to close on the note that voting does start February 22nd. There'll be 250 vote centers. So it is coming up pretty quickly. Uh, and election day is March 3rd. So that's earlier than most voters have been used to in the past. So um, just wanted to make sure we could close out on that and, and get that word out. So. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have one public speaker on item 1A, Paul Grisanti. Hello, Mayor and City Council. I'm pleased to be here. I did go to the library and try out the voting system, and there were a couple of things that were glaring uh, spots, sore spots for me. There's no sense of privacy. And the tablet that you're looking at has excellent visibility from 90 degrees off axis. So people, you know, it would be nice if there were sides on them so that you could have the illusion that you have privacy. The other thing that I'm a little concerned about is there's no, uh, without, I'm just paranoid. The, uh, when you go to vote, you always had to check in, and the people are there are people you actually know. And if I showed up and said I was Skylar Peak, people would go, no, you're not. Uh, and, and if somebody can vote in anywhere in the, in the county and say they're Paul Grisani or Mikey Pearson, and they know the address where he's registered, which is not difficult to get from the from the registrar's office on the list of voters, they're gonna be able to vote. And we're not checking IDs or anything, so am I really paranoid or am I just practical? So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, moving on to item 2B. Uh, Reva, could we have a city manager's report, please? Absolutely. Good evening and Happy New Year. I have a few uh, events coming up that I want to let everybody know about. On Tuesday, January 21st, uh, the Planning Commission will have a public hearing on the La Paz project, and that will start at 6.30 p.m. On January 22nd, uh, which is Wednesday, MRCA will be holding a scoping meeting um, on their proposed uh, access plan, and that will be held at King Gillette Ranch and comments on the plan are due uh, to them by Friday, February 7th. Um, I think they had mistakenly released February 9th, which is a Sunday as the due date, but it's actually February 7th, so just wanted to make sure everybody has that. Um, January 28th, we'll have our first speaker series, our library speaker series event of the year, and it will be with Dan Pfeiffer, who was a former White House communications director. Um, and RSVPs are required, so please go to the city's website to uh, RSVP to that. And then on Thursday, January 30th, um, from 7 to 9 p.m., we'll be having an insurance town hall here at City Hall, and the State Insurance Commissioner, Ricardo Lara, will be here, as well as representatives from the California Fair Plan, and they uh, both uh, Insurance Commission office uh, representatives and the California Fair Plan staff will uh, be willing to meet with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and you can uh, make a reservation um, through the city's website uh, to get a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Um, also, the Malibu High School pool is currently closed. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back open on Wednesday, but just wanted everybody to know that. Um, and then last, I just wanted to answer Mr. Embry's question about the uh, uh, cell tower that's out in front of City Hall. It's called a Colt, which is a cell on light truck. 
um, and we were the only city in the state of California that was able to get one placed here uh, by Verizon. Um, it's in the location that it's in because they thought it would have the best coverage, um, but the agreement that uh, they made with us was that they would be willing to uh, pre-stage it in Malibu, but they will only turn it on in the event of an emergency that requires evacuations where we're losing cell communication. So it was not to be used uh, just for uh, power outage, including a PSPS. It's only uh, if we need to communicate here out of City Hall uh, during an evacuation uh, scenario. Um, and I believe they'll be coming to get it um, uh, pretty soon this month. It was supposed to be here through fire season. So. Uh, that concludes my report, unless you have any questions for me. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, on to council member reports. Uh, who would like to go first? Jefferson? Uh, just the, uh, we have the usual meeting uh, at the end of this month with the uh, Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting. If anybody has any concerns about the Malibu Lagoon, the Adamson House, or any coastal issues that you may want to mention or have me mention at that meeting, please do so. You can contact me at the surf shop or through the city. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Skyler? Uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Good to be back here. I know we were here last week, but that wasn't a full-scale meeting. Um, Rick and I had an ANF meeting earlier this afternoon, and some of the things that we discussed on there was sort of how we're going to allocate some of the budget or money for the upcoming year with uh, the fees that have been going on and some of the planning and building and safety related staffing costs um, and how that will get funded through our uh, fees from Edison and other things. I know Reeve will have some more on that when it comes back to council. And another thing was sort of um, in regards to uh, specifically the, the fee waiver program and there'll be an item coming back on council to that so that people that are um, planning to get their, their fees covered by the city in terms of any rebuilding will have clear direction on how to proceed with that as we approach the deadline that the council set, which was uh, this summer, or which will be, I believe, in the end of June. So uh, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you, Skyler. Rick? Well, he covered everything we covered in our meeting, so... Hope everyone had a great holiday, and I'm um, looking forward to stepping off in the Roaring Twenties on the right foot, and thank you for coming down here tonight. Thank you, Rick. Mikey? Uh, Happy New Year. Um, we've got a big agenda, so we'll try and get to that. I just want to say uh, hopefully we have a much easier year than last year, very tough year for sure, and um, personally, I plan on bringing forward a couple items I feel are very important during the year, and we have a lot of work to do, and let's get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I make, Karen, can I yeah, make a comment please. on public speaking uh, to Craig Hill? Thank you, Craig, for your observations, and all the council members are aware of these things, and we do have priorities, and uh, we do discuss that in public, and we have a priority list. And one of them was the sheriff communications. So rest assured, it's just not blowing in the wind. We're aware of it, Craig, and thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, we're back after a long break. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. I just wanted to thank the staff for all the work that went into the city's holiday open house and for everybody who came to that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I had a meeting with the... Uh, three of the other COG, Los Urgens, Malibu COG mayors, Calabasas, Westlake Village, and Agora, who all happen to be women at this time, the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, I had a meeting with Doug Stewart, my public safety commissioner, for an update and planning session, and I want to thank the members of the Public Safety Commission. They're doing a lot of really important work right now and we have a lot of goals to accomplish. Um, I attended a panel discussion at the American Jewish University on Homelessness on the 7th, and that discussion included three perspectives, housing for the homeless, low-income housing, and the LA Homeless Services Authority. So all of those 
are things that we need to be considering here as we move forward dealing with our homeless issue here in Malibu. Um, we had a homeless strategy meeting. Uh, I want to thank Mikey for leading that, along with Carol Moss, Paul Elder, Deputy Mike Trinan, Susan Duenas, Alex Gittinger, and Terry Davis. That's a huge issue. Every city in this country is dealing with it, and we are no exception. So moving ahead with that, we're going to hear more about that later tonight. Um, Mikey and I attended the League of Cities annual meeting near downtown Los Angeles and represented Malibu at that. Uh, and I had a meeting with two of our student leaders at Malibu High School, both senior girls, I'll note, who are working to promote voter registration, voter participation, and educate the community on the new voting experience. I'm no longer calling it a system. Um, and this past week, I had the honor of visiting the first two fire rebuilds to complete their projects. And I'm very happy for both of those people. I look forward to all the rest of those, uh, those in the process of rebuilding joining them. So that's my report. Do you have any items pulled from the consent calendar? It's probably 3B. Items pulled from consent five, are 3B4. 3B5. 3B6. Oh. I think this is 3B5. Yes. All right, so um, I'll make a motion to approve else? the consent calendar pulling items 3B4 and 3B5. Thank you. And I will note that item 3A1 has been removed from the agenda and it will be brought back at a later date. Awesome. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. So we have, uh, do we have a staff report on item 3B4? Uh, Mayor, I don't have a whole lot to add other than what was in the written staff report. Um, this item was discussed by the council in closed session um, in August and um, it reflects the action um, and direction provided by the council in that closed session. Um, there was a few uh, minor changes that the uh, that Washington Prime, who holds the ground lease for the Malibu Lumberyard, requested. Uh, we don't believe that will have any impact on the rent revenue or the percentage rent that the city receives um, from uh, the Malibu Lumberyard, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. We have public speakers. Two on this item, John Mazza and Ryan Embry. Happy New Year. Uh, this is a small item, but uh, as the public, you try to read this staff report, and there isn't enough information there to know what's going on. So I had to go to the city assistant city manager to get the original lease to find out what the change in, in revenue would be, uh, which is, you know, not really good if the public can't, can't decipher it, especially if you have a master's in finance. Um, what this essentially does is just lower the rent 2% on escalations. And uh, as far as the escalation 2%. And when we originally signed this lease, we had a maximum of four. Now we have a maximum of two if you pass this. This is a 50-year lease, We've, or 54-year lease. We've used about 12 of it. So it does matter in the long term. And I sent you a memo. In the last 50 years, inflation has been 700%. We're counting on 45, probably, somewhere around there. So when you're long gone, the city's going to get, you know, enough to buy a hamburger every year. Uh, and increases. So consider that. Why why does a tenant need a break now? Okay? Why do they? Are they if they ask for it, you give it to them. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out, because obviously they're not going to go broke over $20,000 a year right now. Maybe 30 years from now they'll be smiling. But um, 
The other thing is that the language in the lease, as far as uses, does not compare to what you can provide. It, it gives a definition of an average retail center. We have uh, first class, I think they say A class. We have no definition of that. There is no definition of that. The Coastal Act gives us specific uses you can use for that building. And to promise a tenant uses that they, you cannot give them by law is something that you shouldn't do in a lease because it's binding. And, and it's a very simple change just to say you give them the, what's allowed in the, in the Coastal Act as uses for a CV1 building. Um, and otherwise, you can't, you can't sign the lease as far as I'm concerned. I, I'm a landlord. I wouldn't sign a lease that I couldn't, couldn't live up to. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan Embry. I remember when the city was and did and received donations to purchase the land that um, Jerry Parencio agreed to sell the city at a very attractive price. And the package deal was, as a businessman, he knew that the city was gonna need to have some revenue to pay off the certificates of participation uh, to finance the purchase. So he included some prime commercial property and that included the leased buildings that are currently an animal hospital and now a drugstore and a medical office used to be Coldwell Banker Real Estate. And the revenue from those commercial projects is to pay for those um, expenses of maintaining Legacy Park and to pay off the debt. The city's had a, a bonus in being able to uh, refinance some of its certificates at lower rates. That's the city's business, and the contract is very preferential on this base rent amount, as John was saying, as the escalator is way below inflation. So there really is no need for you to entertain this conversation. What you really need to disclose to the people of Malibu who help pay for this park, to cash donations, is if this operator is in default or is on the brink of default, because if I get this correctly, there was um, Richard Weintraub and Richard Sperber who each personally guaranteed their holdings to the city. And they were local successful businessmen. And then it was sold, I think, to Glimpshire. And now it's, is it, I'm sorry, was it Washington Prime or something? Um, so if they keep selling this lease to successors, each one has a chance to x-ray it and determine what the performance is. And there's no reason for you to be considering this decrease in the base land rent. There's a whole other formula on what minor percentage you get from each of the space rents. And I can understand maybe the space rents are a little less than they wanted. This isn't Rodeo Drive. So the reality of that is a different formula, a different story. Um, if the operator is going to default, then you get a successor operator. But asking the citizens of Malibu to subsidize your business operations, or maybe you got the wrong mix of tenants, that's a reality that a lot of other shopping centers are also facing. But they can't go and ask their city for um, a taxpayer bailout. And that's what this is. You'd be taking money away from the ability to purchase or operate some other park or some other land. Thank you. Please do not amend the lease. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have a staff report on item 3B5? Oh, excuse I me. I have a comment. Go ahead, uh, Kyla. Question for Riva. Please. Um, Riva, I know that in what's the language that's here, it talks about sort of at the end of permitted uses is the language that says the Malibu Municipal Code and wastewater allocations that any of the uses are subject to the terms of that. I had heard the comment from Mr. Maza about it reflecting some language that says it goes with Malibu zoning. Would there be any difference there or is that the correct language that's in here to account for that? 
Well, well the zoning is the entire facility and the, the property, um, but you can't put something in that isn't in the zone under our code. So I think we're saying the same thing, just using different words. Okay. Um, I did want, want to make a comment, um, if, if you uh, might allow me, um, Council, um, regarding the issues that were brought up. Um, and it's a very complicated, several hundred page lease, so it is uh, uh, hard to get through and understand. But the, the way the lease was set up and continues to be set up is that the city receives an annual uh, base rent, regardless of what's going on in the center. Um, right now, we're receiving uh, about $1,020,000 uh, a year, and that rate goes up every five years by no less than 5%. It's supposed to be tied to the cost of living, and the cap on the cost of living increase in the original lease was set at 20%, and the uh, tenant asked if we could lower that down to a cap of 10%. So at this time, it doesn't change anything because cost of living is not anywhere near that. So the, I believe the council um, felt that that was an appropriate change to make. Um, so our uh, amount that we'll get every year does not change and it will continue to go up every five years uh, at no less than 5%. On top of that, the city does receive a percentage rent that um, clause was not changed in the um, request from Malibu Lumberyard uh, ground uh, lease holder. Um, and we receive 30% of any rents that they receive when their rents re exceed $2.2 million a year. So we continue to receive that percentage rent uh, as in the original lease. Um, and we do use the revenue from this site as well as the other commercial sites, the animal hospital, um, super care and Malibu Medical um, to first pay the debt that's associated with uh, the certificates of participation that were issued when we purchased the legacy park uh, property and commercial properties and then the excess funds after we've paid the debt which we've continued to have excess funds every year are used for high priority clean water projects um, to supplant uh, general fund dollars um, and other important projects, um, as well as the maintenance of the park. So um, I think uh, we've done very well with uh, this as a commercial tenant, but happy to go into more detail if you need it. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other council comments? Uh, yes, thank you, appreciate that. Um, I had overlooked this, and I admit that I failed to read into it as much as I possibly should, should probably should have. I just uh, went by our meeting in August and assumed uh, everything was good. So to hear public speakers about this, um, I looked into it a little further. And with Reva understanding and explaining the situation, I understand that part of it. The only part that for me looks tepid is um, with the locally based subtenants and the surety that they have. Because if we as a city uh, sign off on this lease reduction, which it is, I would sure like to make sure that the subtenants, which are locally owned and operated, have a longer term at their lease. So if we're subsidizing anybody, let's try and subsidize local businesses and local tenants. And I see here it's the five year. Uh, if somebody can explain to me that we have the surety for local businesses and local tenants, and it's not going to go away after five years, that would help me fire up and get into this lease adjustment. Comment on that, Reva? Um, the council had asked us to put in that five-year requirement, which was done. Um, uh, other than that, I, I can't speak further than that. Um, and uh, I believe uh, the discussions that we had, if you all recall, were that the uh, formula retail ordinance uh, protects any local tenants um, as opposed to having chain stores come in. So I think uh, that was why we seemed to, it's, you all seemed comfortable with removing that section. Okay, thank you. Anybody so, else? Reva, just to be clear for the kind of put in layman's terms, we had an ordinance that was passed that was a formula retail ordinance, and this project it, property is governed by that, and nothing that's in the lease can change that. So that's sort of the lay of the land here. Correct. All right, can I make a motion to approve this? Item 3B4. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay.
Okay, thank you. All right, moving on to uh, item 3B5, which was also pulled. Do we have a staff report, Jesse? Good evening, Mayor Fair, members of City Council. Uh, the item before you this evening is our agreement with American Ram Company for the design of the temporary skate park on the Crummer Case property adjacent to Malibu Bluffs Park. Uh, we released the request for proposals on October 30th, and we received three proposals back by the deadline on November 25th. We held interviews with two of those consultants, American Ramp Company and California Skate Parks on December 12th. Unfortunately, the third consultant, Site Design Group, was unable to attend due to a previous event they had scheduled, and we're on a pretty tight time frame with this project. So holding the interviews quickly, was it was just something where we couldn't accommodate getting them in. Uh, the interview panel consisted of one Parks and Recreation Commissioner, one Youth Commissioner, one of our local parents, and three city staff. And the panel unanimously selected American Ramp Company uh, due to a variety of factors, their professional proposal, their experience, their, their excitement, and overall vision for the project as well. So uh, as I stated, we have an aggressive time frame for this project. So if the agreement is, a, is approved tonight, we'll look to hold our first public design meeting for the temporary skate park next week. Uh, we would do that on Wednesday, January 22nd at 6 p.m. here at City Hall. And we're very confident with our outreach so far through our surveys and our engagement with the community uh, that it may be possible for us to only have one design meeting for this project. Uh, but if we need to hold a second one, if we just don't get a good vibe and we think we really need to come back and hash some things out, we'll hold a second one the following week on January 29th. So. Uh, with that, we'll have the final design back to City Council in either late February or early March for your review uh, before we requ request the, con before we put out a request for uh, construction bidding for the project. So it's a pretty fluid project. Uh, we still have, the project still has to go to the Planning Commission, which we expect to happen on February 3rd. And so we're, we're trying to keep moving here and, and keeping it going, which is the reason for the tight time frame. So happy to answer any questions you have regarding the project, but our recommendation is uh, approval of the agreement with American Ramp Company. Okay, great. Thank you, Jesse. We have two speaker slips, Hamish Patterson and Jody Gerson. What's up, Al? Good evening, council members. Uh, well, we're, we're getting closer and closer on the skate park thing. And um, I really just wanted to take a moment to thank Jesse. He's been putting in the hard hard work on this. And, and I just appreciate the new city council's vibe with the skate park thing. And it's been a long haul since Papa Jack's closed and we've had our ups and our downs. And it's really pretty cool to be uh, moving forward with this. But I really want to remind the young skateboarders over there that uh, this is just the first phase that we're moving forward. And let's remember, we're trying to get concrete poured. We're going to get temporary pat, par, you know, ramp. But the real stuff's going to come about getting the concrete poured. And you know, we're going to get a little bit of opposition. And we're going to need to stay strong and all that stuff. So let's remember that as we move forward and uh, stay fully engaged. And I know Jesse is fired up on it. And I just want to. Uh, Thank you guys for uh, being very proactive in this in this process because it's uh, definitely needed in Malibu, and I look forward to uh, getting some skating done around here. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jody Gerson. Hi. Um, I just wanted to second what Hamish said too. I came up to say thank you, Judy. Thank you, and Jesse and Reva and Jefferson and Mikey and Karen and Skylar and Rick and Trevor <laughs> and all you kids too. Um, I, um, I agree with Hamish. I know we're going to get some opposition, but I can't imagine anyone would oppose a skate park for the kids. So I really think that um, for the start of the temporary park is amazing and um, something for them to do so that they can um, leave Trancas Market alone. <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Can I make a motion to approve item 3B5? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'd just like to say quickly, Jesse, thank you very much. Um, I went to their website for American Ram Company. Wow. 
Yeah, they're clearly very qualified for this project and probably other ones. They, they've got quite a, quite, a, quite a selection there of what they've done. So thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to item 4A. So may we please have a staff report? Thank you all you kids for coming too. Have a good evening. Make sure you do all your homework. No ollies on the sheriff's cars. Was that an Edelman you were referring to? Um, Madam Mayor, Karen, um, I'd like to ask uh, our legal counsel if this is something that I can stay for. Uh, as the challenge came to the last time we did a parking enforcement uh, uh, debate uh, last year, and I think this is now citywide. I don't have to recuse myself. As, can you throw me an opinion, please? Are these segments located um, by the surf shop again? Okay. Uh, the one at the Malibu Pier is directly across from uh, Malibu Surf Shack. Yeah, in that case, I would recommend that you continue to recuse yourself on this item. It's in the same area. Okay, then I, uh, at this time, Madam Mayor, uh, um, I will recuse myself and pass on listening. I'll be out front when you're done. Thank you, Jefferson. Thank you. Let the record reflect that uh, Council Member uh, Jefferson Wagner has not left the uh, room. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. What we have before you this evening is an ordinance that would be the start of the city's uh, an amendment to our parking ordinances we have and it would be the start of a parking management plan. What staff is proposing to the Council this evening is a parking ordinance that would limit parking so that at one point in the evening you can park on the ocean side of the Pacific Coast Highway and then uh, two hours later the parking restriction would then move to the other side of the highway. So at some, at, at some point in time you would always be able to park and be able to access the coast. However, there would just be this offset between sides of the highway. The proposed ordinance at this point would be on the east end of town. This would be roughly uh, from the city boundary by Topanga to the, there's a home around the 19,000 block of Pacific Coast Highway. A more visual way of understanding that is there's a large open space area there. Caltrans recently finished repairing and uh, on the side of the road to give public parking and access to that area for views of the coast. It's in that open stretch that would be to the east of Big Rock. The second area that was identified for this currently would be the area from Sweetwater Canyon Road to the west end of the crosswalk at the Malibu Pier. Now I realize these are only two areas while the city's Public Safety Commission had recommended this be something citywide. Uh, they had requested portions of Malibu Road, uh, areas around Corral Beach, uh, working your way up into the western end of town and looking towards the city boundary by Leo Carrillo. The reason why staff is only uh, proposing this currently in two areas and the way the ordinance is worded is because the staff has been working with the California Coastal Commission. Uh, they are going to be part of this as well. Uh, after we uh, adopt or whichever happens to the ordinance this evening, 
uh, the next step, if implemented, would be a coastal development permit to allow for the installation of the signage. We will not be able to post the signs without that coastal development permit. That permit is going to be appealable to the California Coastal Commission. So staff has been, we engaged uh, with them early on in conversations uh, because we're looking to do a similar parking ordinance uh, to the county's ordinance, which was appealed by the California Coastal Commission, but ended up uh, being approved. So we've modeled our ordinance after that. And in addition, in discussions with the Coastal Commission staff, the city was advised to uh, implement this program in stages, uh, and not just go for a, a citywide ordinance. And so that's the reason tonight why you're only seeing these two areas. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Okay, we have some public speaker slips. Thank you, Richard. Uh, the first one is Chris Frost, followed by Kathy Caggio, thank you, followed by Cameron Wellwood, and followed by Doug Stewart, <coughs> and Craig Hill. Good evening, Council, staff, Reva. Uh, the no parking sign recommendation that the Public Safety Commission <clears throat> made to the City Council was apparently gutted by the belief that the Coastal Commission would not approve our full request. If we only post Las Tunas and the area around the Malibu Pier, we will drive an extreme number of motorhomes and other vehicles west to Corral Beach and Zuma. Corral is already nearly full at night, <clears throat> And this will push the liveaboards to both sides of PCH, exactly what we're trying to avoid. Driving up here tonight, there was already 40 parked there. Once again, coastal access is compromised, as is the health and safety of residents and motors in that area. We need to negotiate an end to this through safe parking, shelter, and enforcement of any and all applicable parking laws, and a complete posting of the nighttime parking restrictions along the whole of Malibu. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next speaker is Kathy Cadia, followed by Cameron Wellwood, Doug Stewart. I live in Malibu Park. You live, Mikey, you live in Malibu West. How are you letting this happen where we have the campers in front of Zuma Beach? It's your turn to speak, but we'll be talking a lot about that going forward. Okay, and are you saying that it was your recommendation that only do it in two segments, only make the signs? Why don't we get signs in our neighborhood? Can anybody answer me that? He's, he's making the recommendation that's coming from the Coastal Commission. Okay, so I'm making a demand then as a citizen of Malibu that this be throughout Malibu. There should be no reason. I went to see who those people were, who those campers were. In my neighborhood, we have all these burned out people, all these poor citizens that are paying their mortgages, they're paying their property taxes, and they had to get a special permit to get a camper just to camp on their own land. And yet we've got these people from Michigan, look at the license plates, Michigan, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, British Columbia, that's parked in front of Zuma Beach, and they're just living there for free and they are obstructing parking for the rest of us, for the rest of California, for all of LA. They're blocking the view. And what are they doing there? And why is this being allowed? If I went down and parked my car there and left it there, I'd get towed. If I went and parked my RV there, I'd get towed. But how is this happening? You know, whatever laws I've, I've read about on next door that are supposed to apply to this case really don't apply. So I don't know, do, I, do we have to get I'll put money in to get a lawyer to fight this, if anyone wants to join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cameron Wellwood, <laughs> followed by Doug Stewart. All righty, first thing I wanna say is I'm totally opposed to the, uh, the way this thing's been drawn up. I think it should be a height and weight restriction because the way you guys are doing it, it's just gonna, push the problem elsewhere, closer to residences. Sure, they won't have a, a view of the ocean, but they'll be parked where, you know, all the residents like to park, you know. 
And so my uh, idea basically was height and weight restrictions, and you do it citywide, and it doesn't matter where, they can't park on the street if they have a vehicle that's too big or too heavy. So anyway, uh, um, basically, if you go ahead with this, uh, you know, midnight thing and then 2 in the morning, the people that do decide to stay are going to be doing illegal U-turns while everyone's driving around on the highway. That'll be fun. Uh, let's see. Basically endanger everybody. And uh, it's pitch black on PCH, so all these people doing U-turns twice a night to stay parked illegally um, are going to cause all kinds of accidents. And another thing I'm opposed to is signage for 21 miles eventually one day if this whole thing actually goes citywide. That's, like, ridiculous. That doesn't make sense at all. You're just going to put signs all through the whole town? Come on. So, um, yeah, you can't just do two little areas and make the problem ten times worse for everyone else. Um, you know, that's not a solution when you make it uh, – everyone else's problem. So uh, also businesses would suffer, like Malibu Inn or whatever you guys call it now, Cos Escobar. Their patrons can't park on the highway. They'll have to, like, run out and risk their lives moving their cars around to avoid those, uh, you know, the, the parking police guys over there. Anyway, let's see what else we got here. Um, so... Yeah. See, if the height and weight restriction thing would eliminate the need for signs up and down the whole highway and all over every street, you could just have some minimal signage at the county lines, make it well known, put a sign every couple miles or so, done. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't even know why there's a need to discuss whether it should go citywide. These guys are just dumping their sewage everywhere. And, you know, you, you're going to push them even further up to the more pristine parts of Malibu, and they're just going to trash that place. That's like, what are you guys thinking? Um, yeah, so let's see. I got four seconds. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I should have said this at the beginning of uh, public comments. We are not supposed to take speaker slips after the item has begun, so we can't take any more. Uh, our next speaker is Doug Stewart. Good evening, council members and staff. Um, when you come last, it's easy to sort of say everything above I, I uh, endorse, but I do have a couple of points I want to make. Uh, first off, I think it's very clear that we basically have people homesteading on the uh, beach areas, and they're storing vehicles overnight. I've actually been up and checked some of the vehicles, and there are trucks, uh, work trucks, that have been left there overnight. So we're, we're precluding the purpose of the beach access, and that is let the citizens go visit the beach. And I know one of the comments that was made in Coastal Commission is, what if somebody wants to watch the Grunion run? Well, there's no place to park to go watch the Grunion run when everybody is blocked off. So I think we have an issue here that's, that's about access uh, first. And as one of the speakers mentioned, these are out-of-state people. They have very high-value uh, coaches. This is hardly uh, someone that's uh, down and out trying to find a spot on the beach. Um, the other comment I want to make is uh, the comment that the coast that the Public Safety Commission had asked for the entire city. That wasn't true. We had uh, six particular areas that we put in our uh, recommendation to the council: Las Tunas Beach, which is included, Sweetwater Mesa to Malibu Pier. By the way, from the Malibu uh, crosswalk where this uh, is listed to the bridge, already has no parking from midnight to 5 a.m. So this, this is pretty much a, uh, an all-inclusive area there. Then we had uh, Cross Creek to Webb Way. Then we had the western end of Malibu Road to Corral Canyon Road. That's really the Corral uh, Beach. Then we had Winding Way to Head of the Cliff, and then, for the most part, the Zuma Beach area. So it's not as though we took the entire city. We were trying to address the area that is near the beach uh, access. Uh, I think that the point made that uh, this is almost like a trial balloon to try with the Coastal Commission, and we'll move it up in stages. 
I'll defer to the council and staff as to what the best course of action is in working with Coastal Commission. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we got to get this done. You know, there's an old, old commercial out that says, get her done. Well, let's get her done. And there's a uh, package of parking uh, ordinances that need to be done. I know the Public Safety Commission is looking at that to see if we can't make this all inclusive for covering not just parking on PCH, but also uh, parking extended times elsewhere in the city. Lastly, the Sheriff's Department has advised us that they are willing to enforce this ordinance. That was one of the questions about who's going to enforce this at 2 o'clock in the morning. The Sheriff's Department is willing to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Our next speaker is Craig Hill, followed by Ryan Embry, followed by Keegan Gibbs. Hi. Um, I didn't read this. I thought others would be across this and taking care of it, but in the first five seconds of seeing it presented to us, I realized what others have said. Chris, in particular, said it well. Um, and I think the next thing that happens if this passes as is, that all those vehicles shift down to the area between Las Tunas and Las Flores, the land side there all below Big Rock. That's one of the landslide intensive areas right in the middle of the rainy, wet season. So we might get motorhomes with landslides on top of them. Um, I think that the notion that Cameron brought up of measuring it by size, that might have some merit and is worth looking into, although it would be hard to really make a clean, bright uh, cutoff line there. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Ryan Embry, followed by Keegan Gibbs. I've provided the city on many occasions the height restriction parking signs that are implemented in various other cities. Say no parking vehicles over, I think it's six feet high after a certain time of night uh, and so forth. And the, the area on the curb sides and inland sides of Pacific Coast Highway needs to have street sweeping done as one of the Clean Water Act best management practices that this city applied for and is using um, as one of those fulfillment boxes on a form so we can get another grant. And that's very important. And it's very important not to have sewage dumped in, in the storm drains there. And the public works in the county or the state needs to come by and clean the, the junk debris and they actually vacuum out those um, stormwater facilities that go under PCH and under people's homes to keep their homes from being flooded, which has occurred in 1983 at the Big Rock area in particular. Um, the water all just gushed out and wouldn't go down and cars were hydroplating and uh, smashing up into the, the hillside. So the last is uh, the transient occupancy tax, which is due the city from the RV parks overnight stays. And I believe that's, it's like what, 12%, 10%, 12%, 15%. We're uh, not able to uh, tally that amount, which is due the city. The vehicle registrations for out-of-state registration, I'm not so sure if they're not just a violation. Because if you're a resident of California, you need to obtain a California driver's license within, I think, 10 days. Um, or if you become employed in California. And the idea that you can keep your vehicle registration in a low-cost registration state and avoid the um, emissions check requirements and the state of California's requirement that you show proof of insurance at the same time you register your vehicle, those are being skirted. The CHP has had a history of tagging and writing tickets for out-of-state vehicles and making the residents or the owners show up in court and prove that they're out-of-state residents. And this has happened before. It happened at Pepperdine where there are a lot of out-of-state kids in 1983 or 82, uh, hit them right before Christmas. And they went, CHP snuck up there in the middle of the night, wrote tickets left and right. Um, so I think the city needs to enlist the support of the state for these state registration violations and have them come and write their tickets on the state highway for those vehicles that are the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Keegan Gibbs.
Uh, good evening, Council. Uh, we deliberated this on the Public Safety Commission about the placement and locations of the different uh, no parking signs, and particularly to prohibit homelessness encampments, essentially, right? Um, for me personally, I had the biggest issue with it is that I feel that this is just going to push the encampments and disperse them into different areas inside the community. Um, outside of even all the going as far west as basically the county line that Doug had mentioned all the different locations, um, there are plenty of other areas where there aren't residential homes that these camps can be parked in front of. Another area would be across from Moon Shadows, that entire street that essentially runs from Big Rock all the way to Las Flores on the land side. Um, that's in front of residential areas. Um, unfortunately, they're parked in ultimately the most ideal area for residents right now where there are no residents. Las Tunas is an area that doesn't even have a beach that you can visit or at least dry sand. Um, something needs to be done about this. But I don't think this is the correct approach, unfortunately. Um, I think uh, if you want to ban RVs or prevent IV RVs or restrict them, I think uh, a permitting process and restricting height and length is probably going to be the best way. Santa Monica and Venice have gone through this and they've kicked the can down the road a few different ways by Venice, I mean Santa Monica first initializing height restrictions and pushing all the camps over to Venice and Venice started doing that and now it's pushed them towards us. Um, so anyways, I'm not sure, I don't really have the right answer, but I do believe that this isn't the right answer. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, council comments. Yeah, I'll <clears throat> kick it off. <clears throat> Mayor uh, Ferrer, if you'd like, staff can address some of the issues and let you know a little more about how we got to this point. Sure, that would that'd be, be great. helpful. Sure, let's okay. do that first. Thank you, Bonnie. Sure. This isn't. This is about the third time, actually, that I come back <laughs> with a, a parking ordinance. For, uh, and where we started with it was originally overnight parking, and it was going to be an inconvenience for some residents, and there was a request that we look at a permitting process. However, looking in, into the permitting process, that kind of gets you into preferential parking, and that was seen as um, something that would hinder coastal access, and we were going to run into issues with the California Coastal Commission about trying to implement a permitting uh, process, because I was looked at favoritism towards the residents. Uh, so we've looked at trying to, we went towards a new, another alternative. Uh, that alternative was an oversized vehicle ban. And uh, we do, uh, we brought to the council a couple years back, I think maybe it was two years ago, we did bring an oversized parking vehicle ordinance and a parking ban. And that was something citywide. However, what we ran into with that was that if you were to target commercial vehicles, delivery trucks, electricians, uh, you know, businesses, uh, there were no issues there. But the moment that that ban uh, started to affect uh, recreational vehicles like RVs, then we were getting into environmental justice issues. And the Coastal Commission, even though we did approve something at the local level, uh, we received a comment letter and objections that there were going to be appeals with the implementation uh, because this was targeting campers. And in doing so, if you were to target an RV, you essentially were limiting that person's ability to travel to the state uh, and park and use coastal access uh, areas because we wouldn't allow the parking of RVs. And we did look at just limiting that parking in the evening hours. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that um, when the Coastal Commission had a hearing, and uh, anybody can, can, it would probably be useful to review this hearing. It occurred in October of 2019 on the counties. Um, it was actually a coastal development permit for posting of signs that um, had the same one side of the street than the other side of the street um, in, that, in the area just to the east of us. Um, one of the major issues that the Coastal Commission itself brought up was um, concern about uh, environmental justice, if you want to call it that, but basically displacing people who are homeless and, and um, affecting lower cost, you know, access to the coast and things like that. Um, that 
clearly um, in in, uh, putting in place that um, program in that location has moved uh, the problem to Malibu and they, the Coastal Commission staff um, advised us that um, what they would like to see or what they feel like, basically it boils down to if we post um, signs, get uh, process a coastal development permit for posting signs in accordance with this program, those will be appealable to the Coastal Commission. So uh, we are looking for a path that would allow us to solve this problem, even if it's incremental, um, that would hopefully not get hung up with a round of appeals and um, get turned down by the Coastal Commission. Um, the, they, one of the big selling points with the county's program is that they were able to convince the Coastal Commission that they also have um, a safe parking program that's in, in process. Um, our city council uh, considered something at Dan Blocker Beach as a potential location. That's, you know, that, that met with some resistance and some impractical uh, things, but the, the county and LA City have, are partnering on a program to provide alternative parking locations. And that was, a, like I said, a big selling point with um, the Coastal Commission as far as going along with, with what they proposed um, just to the east. Of so um, is there anything else you want to add, Trevor? Uh, no, I, I, I think you characterized that pretty well in terms of uh, for a, a citywide program, they were looking for a, a sort of a citywide um, attack on this environmental justice issue. So if there was something in place in the city that I think the citywide approach would be uh, would be supported by the uh, at least the staff at Coastal Commission. You're saying that you think that the Coastal Commission would support citywide? If there was a solution, if there was a place to park, a safe parking program, or some kind of other program that's put in place for people to go to to provide a safe alternative, and then they would be more supportive in, restrict, in our restrictions that we would want in terms of uh, limiting parking along the coast. So that would cover us under Martin versus Boise. That would be the idea as well. You know, so since that wasn't taken up by the Supreme Court, we do have to, you know, have provide some space for people to go to. You can't make it, you can't criminalize sleeping in the city. So that would be um, something we need to consider if we're gonna have something citywide. So I think the intent is to eventually bring something back citywide. But at this point, I think this is um, the extent staff was able to determine that we could get something through at this point. Right, and we, we fully recognize that this is just, this is only a partial solution, if a solution at all, because it, we expect that it will, you know, result in relocating things, but this, we're just trying to, we're trying to get um, something going in this way so that um, it at least gets a start to the solution. Okay, thank you. Okay, council, comments. Um, so it, I mean, it seems like we're getting essentially screwed over from the Coastal Commission on what we want to do with this. Um, I think that that's evident to everybody that's in the room. And I think that the people that came and spoke have offered some good suggestions for us, but we're sort of left in the, uh, they got us on this one. Let me just say that. It's sort of what it, it's sort of what it feels like, you know. Every the, week. The problem. Excuse me. Decorum. Thank you. That, and I know that when even I think on previous council we went and tried to address this issue. I think with the size and whatnot. How is it that some of the other cities are able to? I want to say I feel like Santa Monica restricts the length and height of vehicles. So it's my understanding, uh, Councilmember Peak, that those signs were put in before the Coastal uh, Act, and so they are pre-existing, um, which is one of the challenges that we are now trying to comply with the Coastal Act and are uh, kind of hitting these roadblocks. Um, one of the um, areas that the Coastal Commission did focus on, as Bonnie mentioned, was the fact that the county could demonstrate uh, other opportunities and places for people to go um, if they went east on Pacific Coast Highway, they could get into Santa Monica, they can get into the city of LA, and they can uh, take advantage of places to park uh, that the county uh, uh, has. And so in some of our discussions, the fact that we're now uh, looking at the areas that are 
close to our eastern border, for lack of a better way of describing it, we could also be, quote unquote, um, you know, taking advantage of those um, uh, areas that the county is also taking advantage of. So it's our, our staff's inclination on this is to go and basically make the same argument that the county made, but then offering these spaces within the county Correct. to say you guys could go and park there. Okay. Correct. Um, also, uh, you know, we did discuss with the Coast Commission uh, staff that if we brought forward an item um, as the Public Safety Commission had recommended that uh, banned uh, or, or instituted this parking, uh, these parking regulations throughout the city, um, it would m most likely have just gone, not been approved and would have been appealed probably by the Coastal Commission themselves. And so we thought this was a, a safer path to try and get at least something taken care of um, as we work on some of the other issues facing people who are uh, living in vehicles or living in RVs. So we're looking at it kind of as a multi-prong approach. I know it's um, not the exact solution that everyone was hoping we'd bring forward, but we think it would be a successful way of getting through the hurdles. Now, is there opposite or does, is staff aware that if we are under the impression, like let's say if we were to include Zuma Beach, do you think that that would be appealed? If we were to do something on the West End as well, in conjunction with this at this time, or do we just do not know? We, d we don't know for certain, but um, the advice was to start with smaller segments. But um, I mean, the council, if the council would like us to add that, we could certainly discuss it with them. I think that the council should consider time. adding that as well at this time. So I, I think what's hard here too is that and for all of you out here is that we're applying logic to a really difficult situation where sometimes logic isn't working legally. So it's, it's really, really, really frustrating. Um, I think I'm very wary about pushing this somewhere else as well because it's gonna do that. And I'm worried about just leaving it on top of the residents that are having to deal with it. So there's no win there. I, um, I can think of two other options that I would bring up, number one, is potentially just do the area by the pier, which won't won't push anyone anywhere at this point from what I see. Um, or number two is the way that the way that legally as I understand we can deal with this is to come up with a safe parking program because then we can enforce our parking rules. So we could wait and do that. Um, Either that or actually a third option would be to add additional areas knowing we won't get them, but to show that that's our goal. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, you know, ask for more than you're going to get and then back down. But I, I just, then we're pushing the problem around and I don't know, I don't know that we're really, we're not, we're not helping because this, there's, this issue is just going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Yeah, the problem has gotten a lot more complicated with the Boise case, um, but the, um, Yes, Boise ver Martin versus Boise is absolutely applicable, and it's a real problem. I, I know you don't think it is, but the problem is, is people in RVs right now are considered homeless in a legal sense. So I don't know any way around that right now, um, as far as I'm aware. But um, and then we have the coastal access issue on top of it. So we have this double whammy on a highway we don't own. So. I mean, to me, maybe, and obviously I'm trying to push this forward, this issue forward with my item tonight, but maybe, you know, we consider getting Council to the Pearson. city council meeting and seeing about a safe parking program so we can actually go around Boise, uh, Martin versus Boise, we satisfy it. And another thing, just because a lot of these people that are living in RVs or some of them have issues some of them are from outer state, whatever. It doesn't mean, in my experience of knowing them and dealing with them, that they're unintelligent. That's not the issue. That's not why they're in the in the RV. The and 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 it's very obvious to me that they have a access to legal help pro bono that's just waiting for these cases. So this is a very complicated issue. I know it seems one way, but I spent two decades working on this issue and this is as bad as it's ever been and this is tricky and we really have to strategize well in my opinion. Councilmember Pearson, perhaps one thing we can offer from staff 
is if you do wish to include other areas in your recommendation this evening, we can then process the coastal development permit applications for the signage separately. So we don't just give one package to the Coastal Commission saying, here's the city's request for three or however many areas you create. We could do it as a separate coastal development permit so that if there is perhaps one area that they're concerned about or they feel like, for example, if you get to the west end of town, that starts putting us very far away from those safe parking lots that we're trying to latch on to uh, from the county of uh, Los Angeles. Um, if they feel that perhaps Uma Beach is too far, they perhaps could take issue with that CDP, but hopefully not with the CDPs that are towards the eastern end of town. Well, that, that brings up a question because it's been very noticeable to me, and I've, I've discussed it with a couple of you, that Ventura County has added huge amounts of no parking just out of county line, across the county line. And as I understand, it's because they have services that we don't have, so they, they get that right back. Is there any way that we can make that same argument on the west side as well, that there are services available close, or is it because it's in a different county that creates another problem, or how might that work? We can look into it. I think it's more of a distance issue. I don't think it's more of a county issue. Uh, I believe in our discussions, just in people's minds looking at this spatially, uh, the eastern end of town is directly adjacent to LA County. Uh, we share a common border there, whereas we don't share a common border. I know it's not much, there's not much of the county between the city and Ventura County, uh, but I think it's more of just the spatial thing, but we could have, uh, look into that with them. I would make the suggestion that we include all the areas and we do them separately and if the county decides that they don't want to do it in a couple of them then let them make that argument you know and we can make our argument to say that we're in this proximity to parking but all that I see foresee happening if we just go after these two on the east end we're just going to move it west and you're going to watch this summer be a disaster for people at Zuma Beach and I think that that area sees a much higher volume of visitors than some of the area, other areas we're talking about, in part, partly because it has a ton of parking. Um, it also has a lot of, you know, there's the, you got the Makos camp, you have a bunch of other youth camps that are there on the beach. And I, I think it's, it's, we have to be very mindful of this. So I would be in favor of processing it in all the areas that were suggested. Um, and if they want to, you know, fight us on it, then We'll, we'll make that fight or drop it. And wouldn't that give us the option of deciding whether to go forward in certain areas because of that? Absolutely. Have you, when in your discussions with the Coastal Commission, did you sort of feel them out for these more extended areas that were presented by the uh, Public Safety Commission? Um, the Coastal Commission staff was uh, very concerned about that. They, well, in, they anticipated that the Coastal Commission would not respond real positively to big swaths that that we didn't have um, analysis and, and a, you know, associated program for and things like that. Well, that's the staff. Right. It's not necessarily the commissioners themselves, so. Right, and, and on this issue, the, the commission itself has been more um, conservative or stringent than the staff has. When the county went forward with theirs to Coastal, was what was the you know of the however many commissioners were there was it split almost was it like or was it unanimous or we did not know i don't know the answer to that and and don't forget it took them over two years for that to go through so they didn't just bring it forward and suddenly the parking was banned there that was a two-year process i think it yeah it took a while to kind of negotiate something that um the, the Coastal Commission staff felt like would um, still accommodate the coastal access question. You might remember um, when we went before the Coastal Commission for um, the trying to post uh, signs in the, the uh, turf rider, the pier area, um, the Coastal Commission at that appeal hearing on that CDP, you know, they were arguing that two hours wasn't long enough. Yeah, well, we, we had our the um, time period was officially something like two hours, but um, effectively it was only going to end up being like a 30-minute restriction. 
and they still felt like that was going to um, limit coastal access for the Grameen Run, which somebody mentioned, or whatever, enjoying the beach at night. So um, well, I'm going to be in favor of going for it for, I would like to make a motion that goes um, at all the areas. I'd like areas. to say something. Okay, a few things. Um, I can't disagree with everybody who spoke. It's the ultimate irony that the Coastal Commission's uh, focus is on coastal access, which is now being blocked bumper to bumper from one end of Malibu to the other. There's no denying that. The other uh, mission of the Coastal Commission is coastal protection. So I will say I've had many conversations uh, and we heard it tonight about sewage being dumped on the highway. I have specifically asked particular people if they have any evidence, photographic evidence of that. If you have it, will you please email it to the council at your earliest convenience, okay? That's a gigantic public health hazard. Um, or to code enforcement. Thank you. So, so far, I haven't seen photographic evidence, but, you know, we all hear about it. So, so I'm, I'm interested in any evidence there. Um, it may make sense in me, uh, my opinion, and sounds like with everybody, uh, to make this application segmented um, and, and, and get what we can. Um, And, uh, but, but I will say, I, I fear going for an all or nothing approach um, from one end of Malibu to the other, because if that gets turned down, you know, we're just back to square one. I'd like to see something get on the books as soon as possible and at least give us some relief. I realize it just relocates the problem. We all understand that. Um, but if we can get something on the books and then, as Mikey was saying, um, expand that when we have other accommodations like safe parking. Um, there's another element to this. So, so that would be my request um, to ask for those three areas that were identified, the two in the staff report, plus uh, an area of Zuma Beach. There's something else that um, I was made aware of, and I want to thank Deputy Mike Trinan for making me aware of this. Carlsbad. Carlsbad has a parking enforcement. I welcome everybody to look it up. And there are two main aspects to this. Um, vehicles not driven. Uh, any, anybody parked for 72 hours or more has got to be moved a tenth of a mile. Because right now, as I understand it, you can roll your tires a half rotation and then roll them back. That doesn't help anybody, or anybody except the vehicle owner. Um, and the other thing is this, there's an RV ordinance in Carlsbad uh, that ties RVs to a residence and that uh, those RVs can get a, uh, a permit, which must be displayed if that RV is parked on a city street between 2 and 5 a.m. The vehicle must be parked within 400 feet of the residence that was granted the permit. This makes sense to me, and I thank Carlsbad for breaking that ground, and uh, I would like the staff to look into that if we don't add it to our item tonight, I'd like it to be brought back as an additional ordinance. Um, and let's take advantage of, of the work that's been done and that's gotten through the Coastal Commission. So I'm gonna stop with that. Do we have any other comments? Karen. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment. Sorry, Reva. Go ahead, Susan. One second. Oh, I was just gonna say, I was Susan. Reviewing. I was reviewing the uh, oversized vehicle ordinance that we have on our books, and we have that same ruling for residents to be able to get a permit for an RV for 72 hours 
Um, otherwise, it has to be move. It has to be within a thousand feet of a residence. So we do actually have that already. Um, and I talked to the parking enforcement um, sergeant. I think it was down Carlsbad today. Um, and there are some differences in their situation. One of them is they have a lot of beach parking all right there, so it's easier for them to control parking on their main drag, which is actually a road that is under city control. And they've never had any objection from Coastal Commission with any of their parking enforcement uh, methods. And one of the newer things that they, they're installing like recently was also tick marks to show like the size of vehicles. That's something that sounds like is relatively new there they're enforcing because they've had the same struggles, but they've had a lot more uh, ways to deal with it because the road that is their main drag, that it's under their control and the fact that they have so much available beach parking. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, I got a comment if I could. Um, for the speakers, thank you very much for coming down here. I, I would say that this is probably, there's no dissenting voices on this issue in Malibu. I think everybody feels the same way. And, um, you know, for a while, for that Malibu actually has a, a, a rule that you can't sleep in your car. And it was enforced. And it was well enforced for a long time until this court decision came down. And they know that it, you can't enforce it now and this court decision was actually appealed to the Supreme Court and as I understand it, the Supreme Court didn't want to hear it so for them in the meantime we're stuck with it it's real and if if we could up if we could just change the parking rules on a state highway that happens to be kind of our main street we would do it and we'd do it probably in a second but that's not the reality of the situation the reality is it's a state highway and another reality is you have the Coastal Commission that is a lot of control over what happens. And those are the realities of what we have to deal with. So we're doing the best we can. And I understand the frustrations out there from everybody. There's nobody who disagrees with anybody. Nobody really li likes the whole uh, RV world dropping anger on PCH for months on end. We're all in agreement on that. We're just trying to deal with the world as it is and the realities of the, uh, the governmental institutions and policies that, that are our present reality. So I do think it's, I appreciate you guys doing reconnaissance, you know, with the Coastal Commission and, and figuring out what they will accept. And I think it's wise for us to be incremental, maybe add, you know, Zuma Beach to it without, and if they, if they, if, if, would you mind, please? You're not just supposed to bark out in the middle of the meeting, all right? We're all, following the rules here, all right? So please don't be so disruptive. We heard you, we acknowledge you, we agree with you, okay? And we're doing the best job we can. And if you don't agree with us, I understand, okay? But there's a whole room of other people that are not speaking out here. So I'd appreciate if you would be polite as we were polite with you. Thank you very much. So I would say that probably the best thing we could do is do what you said and maybe like Karen suggested and, and uh, Skylar is maybe try to zoom a beach also and see how they go and if they don't then let's go for it but you know they got another agenda item here which is we're going to be wrestling with the home the greater homeless problem that is not only our problem but it's the problem of the state of california and um as we do that we can probably start working on the safe parking issue and and start with the incremental beginning and start to expand it maybe out from there but i appreciate the hard work that you've done in dealing with these difficult government agencies and trying to do the most realistic job. And you know, I'm, I have a little history of dealing with the Coastal Commission as does the city, and I think you've done a smart job, so I appreciate it, thanks. Okay, I have to just say this, because it's, it's also real. If we're adding Zuma as an incremental um, request, let's add Corel, because it's just as bad there as any place else. I do know that it's very bad there. My, and I would, I agree with you. I'm totally in for that. I'm just going to acknowledge that in terms of the coastal's eyes, they may look at that differently because there's not as many residences right there. That's the only thing that I'm saying. And I, I'm totally in favor of doing it. I'll in fact make a motion to do that. Add Zuma and Corral and do these and, and approve them uh, separately. Um, 
One thing, since we haven't noticed Zuma or Corral, we'd have to bring those back separate so we could pass this tonight or we can continue the item to bring it back all together. Another thing is this is amending the municipal code. We'll later have to come through with the CDPs. We could do a separate CDP for each area. So then if there is ones that are appealed, perhaps they don't appeal all the CDPs. That's one way we could sort of give Coastal the, op the option to leave some of them alone. Um, just a suggestion. Uh, Reva, could we bring this back at the next meeting with those changes? Uh, we'll bring it back just as soon as we can. If there's a noticing issue, it won't uh, be able to be at the next meeting, but we'll, as soon as we are able to, we will bring it forward. It, it's, since it's not in the zoning code, it doesn't have a, you know, like a long noticing period. I don't think we had to do any sort of ads for this other than posting the agenda and um, staff report. So it'd be, a month, it'd be a month or two. Is the preference for the council to do it all together rather than pass part of it tonight and then bring it back for Corral and Zoom? I, mean, I was going to ask Reva and staff what's easier for them. Um, we're, we can do it either way. We could certainly approve what's uh, on the agenda for this evening and return with an item. It won't be the next meeting because that agenda goes out in a couple days, but we could certainly bring it back uh, for the first meeting in February. And it would be the same. It would just include the additional areas. Okay. I would like to make a motion to approve these and then to do the CDPs for them separately and to bring back a future item that would be Zuma and Corral. Okay. Is that would be uh, the motion we do approve ordinance number 460 in ordinance of the city of Malibu determining the project is categorically exempt from, from CEQA and adding chapter 10.91 to title 10 vehicles and traffic of the Malibu Municipal Code to prohibit parking on portions of the landward side of Pacific Coast Highway between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m. and seaward side of Pacific Coast Highway between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. daily on two segments of Pacific Coast Highway. And then also you're directing staff to bring back an item in um, at the next available meeting that would also consider adding areas of Zumba Beach and Corral to um, and Westward Beach, which is a, not the highway city road and, and Westward Beach um, to bring it back, back to a future um, council meeting to consider those three areas and then also uh, to direct staff when these two come back for coastal development permits to uh, bring them as separate CDPs for each separate area. Does that reflect your motion? Yes, sir. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. I think we bring uh, Commissioner and Council Member Wagner back now. Okay, let's take a quick break. You got it's Jefferson. 8.38 p.m. Uh, let's reconvene at 8.45, please. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Time to resume. Okay, we are resuming the meeting with item 4B. May we please have a staff report? Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. The next item on the agenda is the proposed fire resistant landscape ordinance. Allow me to back this. We are way advanced on this PowerPoint. There we go. Excuse me, Jessica, um, could we take the side conversations outside, please? Thank you. And oh. close the door. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, the fire resistant landscape ordinance. Uh, the purpose of the ordinance is to minimize risks of to life and property by decreasing a property's likelihood of burning and spreading fires. There are five key components with the proposed ordinance. They include prohibiting highly flammable trees and shrubs, creating a five foot dis defensible space around structures, implementing provisions on trees and shrubs planted near power lines, and incentivizing non flammable materials in the landscape. Lastly, the proposed ordinance is a citywide ordinance applying to both commercial and residential properties for new and updated landscaping. When the first uh, proposed amendment was presented to Zeracy's in October, it included a provision that would restrict the planting of any type of palm tree, eucalyptus, and pine tree. Zeracy's determined that the amendment would be too restrictive and directed staff to draft a provision that prohibited planting palm trees with the potential to grow over 18 feet in height. At the November 18th Planning Commission hearing, the commission recommended adding a provision, adding the provision back for palm trees, banning the planting of any type of palm tree regardless of the height. Staff has offered an alternative um, which allows palm trees to be planted with a maximum height of six feet this would allow for ornamental palm varieties, and it would also make it easier for, you can, you can have palm tree varieties that are easier to maintain and, and less complicated to extinguish. Staff then proposed an amended provision to prohibit planting eucalyptus, pine trees, cypress, cedar, and tree of heaven varieties within 30 feet of a structure. The commission recommended expanding the distance to 50 feet and expanding the prohibited planting list to the complete list of plants to avoid provided by the Santa Monica Mountains. Staff has maintained the 50 foot distance from structures in this provision, but recommends limiting the prohibited trees to the five species mentioned above and posting the complete list of plants to avoid on a website that encourages firescaping with, throughout the landscape. It should also be mentioned that there is an exemption that is included that would allow the planting of eucalyptus trees for the purpose of providing monarch butterfly habitat. The second main component, component on the proposed ordinance centers on creating a five foot defensible space around structures as advised by the National Fire Protection Association. Defensible space is defined as a natural and landscaped area around a structure that is maintained and designed to reduce fire. Maintaining the def defensible space around structures reduces the risk that a fire will spread and provides firefighters with safer access to the threatened areas. In order to create a five foot dis defensible space, staff is proposing a provision that prohibits hi highly flammable mulch trees and shrubs within five feet of a structure as recommended by the National Fire Protection Association. From five feet to 30 feet, they recommend limiting flammable mulch and vegetation to non-continuous patches or areas. The Planning Commission recommended expanding the provision to include prohibiting artificial turf within five feet of a structure and prohibiting wood trips and shredded tires or rubber anywhere on the site. In addition to mulch and vegetation, staff is proposing to restrict wooden fences, walls, and detached structures within five feet of a structure. 
The proposed ordinance also includes a provision that limits the heights of trees planted next to or under overhead power lines. Each year, the power company performs maintenance and trimming of existing trees in order to keep branches and leaves from touching power lines, thereby starting fires. Recently, the regulations that mandate the amount of trimming required increased. To minimize the amount of trimming required and reduce potential fire hazards, staff is proposing an amendment that would limit the height of new trees planted under or near power lines. Power companies recommend that trees planted below or within 20 feet of a power line have a maximum growth height of 25 feet and 40 feet for trees planted within 20 to 50 feet of overhead power lines. A final amendment that was proposed to Zeracy's and the Planning Commission would incentivize the use of fire resistant fencing to diminish and diminish the need for tall hedges. The amendment proposes allowing front yard fences, walls, and gates to be constructed up to a maximum of six feet with solid material and allow them to be view impermeable if constructed with non-flammable materials. Zeracy's advised staff to remove the amendment as they felt the six foot solid fence and gate would create a security issue for the homeowner. Staff consulted with law enforcement and the fire department for comments. Both agencies indicated that the six foot solid fence and gate would not create an additional security issue. When presented to the Planning Commission, the amendment resulted in a split decision with two commissioners feeling that the solid fences would change the character of the city and two commissioners feeling the solid non-flammable fencing would help protect structures from catching on fire by blocking the embers that are blowing. Should the council choose to approve this amendment, the provision would be added to the proposed ordinance. In addition to the amendments discussed, the proposed ordinance includes adding definitions to the LIP and MMC, amending the general development standards and distance between building sections, and moving the entire MMC chapter 9.22, which is the current landscaping ordinance, to a newly established MMC chapter 17.53. It should also be noted that the proposed ordinance does not exempt properties, properties destroyed by natural disasters from having to comply with the fire protection standards. Upon adoption of the proposed ordinance, staff is prepared to research additional fire resistant building materials and methods in order to draft a fire hardening ordinance and draft a potential second phase to the fire resistant landscape ordinance. Staff will also be creating a Firescape web page where we will post the list of recommended plants and plants to avoid, as well as provide resources and ideas on how to further create defensible space in a landscape. Finally, staff is seeking a recommendation to create an outreach and education program that would encourage the firescaping, emphasize the need for proper vegetation maintenance, and establish an invasive fountain grass eradication program. Correspondence was received on the proposed ordinance and that was distributed to you earlier and uh, that concludes staff's presentation. I Thank just, you, Jessica. Um, sorry, I, I just want to say one thing, Bonnie. Oh, okay, um, sure. We're not able to take any more speaker slips at this time. Okay, I just wanted to add that uh, the last few items that Jessica mentioned as, as far as moving forward, um, those would need to be addressed with, at the mid-year budget with the work plan. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, we have some public speakers. John Mazza, you have four minutes. Richard Lawrence is here. And then Craig Hill, you have four more minutes. Craig Frost is here. Okay, and then Keegan Gibbs. We ready? Good evening. Um, one of the things that came out with this staff report is that <clears throat> the Planning Commission's recommendations basically came second. They came as an attachment. And as you know, we spend three to four hours on meetings like this. In this case, we asked experts to come in. We had, we had state parks. We had butterfly. We had all kinds of experts come in. And with lists of what plants we shouldn't use, we should use. We spent a lot of time on it. You're going to get, you know, half an hour maybe. Uh, so I don't want to go through all the details, but I hope you understand that the, the Planning Commission did a lot of work on this, and, and there were reasons we made every decision. And we went through each single word in the whole ordinance that was proposed to us. So, for example, when you get the, the purpose of this 
ordinance is fire prevention, okay? And all of the people on the Planning Commission and all of you lived here during the fire, and some of you fought it. You know what's going on. Our, none of our staff does, okay? So real practical experience counts. And for example, the reason we ban palm trees is one of the examples given on dangerous plants in the LA County Fire Manual was a, a three-foot palm tree by a front door, okay? Palm trees are little rockets. They just send out, as Mikey knows, they are the worst thing you can have. So we recommended to ban them. To, to have them as ornamental plants next near a house is nuts, okay? But you wouldn't know that unless you tried to put one out. I tried to put one out. It took 45 minutes because they, they get down in and they just keep burning. So there's one reason why we ban palm trees. There's other things like this burning of rubber, shredded up tennis shoes, things like that that make no sense to keep in there. But the main thing is we put a table recommended for these mountains on what you should not plant, and we put it right in the ordinance. It's gone, okay? It's in some website somewhere. Well, homeowners, they're not going to use that. They're not going to know. The, the compliance officer isn't going to know. It's not in the law. It's never going to happen. So that's an important thing because we had experts bring in specific lists just for here, just for these mountains. So I really hope you consider that the Planning Commission really worked hard on this and there's a reason for everything we did. Now, one of the reasons for this law is to prevent fires. The size of your fence in the front yard does not prevent fires, okay? It does not. We had two houses on Zumaras burned down for that very reason. We had two houses with 12-foot ficus trees around them. We couldn't figure out if they were on fire or not. We couldn't get hoses through them. We could, you know, we had an eight-foot gate in one case, and so they burned to the ground, okay? And it is dangerous. Now, when staff said they asked the sheriff's department, they asked one of the deputies, okay? As Jefferson knows, uh, Sheriff Vier, what's his name, Villaraigosa or whatever it is, had a meeting at Duke's. I asked him right in front of the whole crowd, should you have a fence in front of your house if you don't want to get robbed? He says the very worst thing you can do is have a fence. You need, a, you need no fence and you need a dog, okay? And that's what they train them. So that's the difference in, you know, picking up information you need to have and real information. So I really hope you adopt the Planning Commission's uh, version of this or put it off and have another hearing because this is very complicated. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Craig Hill with four minutes and then Keegan Gibbs. Okay, I agree with some of that. Um, a few general comments and then some details. The Planning Commission wrangled together some good ideas for this. You'll have some of your own. Uh, so far, though, I think the process has been too ad hoc without enough systematic integration of the expertise. Um, it's been treated as sort of a political matter, calling on public opinion with some random documents by experts, but not enough of that. We've had no one from the fire department weigh in, from the fire prevention office or forestry. I mentioned a few other experts in my letter. We haven't even asked Jerry Vandermulen to write up his best ideas. So staff should liaise with both county fire prevention and forestry to identify any fire codes that relevant to this that could be worth adopting directly into the municipal code because they can be more effectively enforced if built into a new landscape plan right from the start. For example, the code that allows only sparse fire safe plants within 10 feet of a roadway or a driveway Right now, that's not being enforced, even though one way people get killed is by trying to drive through tunnels of burning vegetation. So tonight, perhaps you should deliberate, make some contributions towards a tighter draft, uh, which could then be distributed among experts for them to weigh in on it at a subsequent hearing, which could be a joint session with the Planning Commission or not. Now, a few specific points made in my letter, just by way of sort of bullet points. The structure of the house itself is the most important, way more important than the landscaping. So prioritize code upgrades that integrate both fire safe and green designs and materials. That's where we're going to save lives. 
Um, revisit side yard setbacks. Houses burn hotter than brush and set off chain reactions with other houses. The setback rules seem not to have been written with fire prevention in mind foremost. Limit planting of trees and shrubs in rows. Hedges should not be dense. They should be planted on five foot centers minimum to slow the spread of fire and reduce the heat radiation from a row. Um, that's at the five foot center is based on a fire department regulation. Front yard fences and hedges are two separate issues. Keep the impermeable fences no higher than 42 inches along with what the sheriff has said, then allow sort of open hedges behind planted on more widely, five foot center, so you could still look through deliberately if you need to, uh, but they create sort of a psychological barrier. Slopes are significant in the way fire spreads, but must also be considered in terms of erosion. Only a few types of plants can strike the balance growing low, but with deep roots, for example, the pigeon point cultivar of coyote brush specifically. It grows to only a foot high, but has deep roots. Upslopes and downslopes call for different approaches, one needing less and one that more protection. Fountain grass ecosystem is ready to reburn every few years compared to about 15 years for native scrub and chaparral. Fountain grass is quickly invading Malibu from east to west. So encourage the state to implement eradication through the Conservation Corps or inmate crews. The grass has to be dug out by shovel and the disturbed soil then either compressed or replanted with natives. You could also require residents to keep it off their own property. Ban palm trees of any height if they have fibrous tissue or leaf stem bases. They trap embers, as John was mentioning, and, and they become ember fountains. Escondido has listed the worst of them, but it might simplify enforcement to just ban all species. And then last two sentences. Uh, a eucalypts, there are about 800 different species. They require a nuanced approach with an emphasis on maintenance. They need litter clearance and sufficient water. I can talk a bit more about Australia if you want. Um, I picked up this brochure in the lobby. It's beautiful, but it has nothing in it about maintenance of trees or shrubs. Thanks. Thank you. Keegan Gibbs. Good evening, everybody, again. Um, so um, this is, a, I, I need to remind you guys of something first. This isn't about fire prevention. Fires are gonna happen no matter what vegetation we plant. Fires are happening, right? And this is about preventing homes from burning. When we talk about catastrophes, the only reason why I use that description of a catastrophe is when homes burn down. If there's a wildfire out in the wildland and it's just a bunch of plants burn, it's, we don't call it a catastrophe, right? This is about preventing homes from burning down, right? So, um, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, it's, this is a very long ordinance. I think ultimately needs to be deliberated down the line. Um, there's an organization called Wildfire Partners in Colorado that has done an incredible job at implementing and codifying best, best practices both for construction and for landscaping. Landscaping in the zero to five foot zone is hands down the most important thing. Outside of that zero to five foot zone, it, it is drastically reduced in terms of the importance. That zero to five foot zone is exponentially more important. And that's what all we need to be focusing on for the most part. To be, um, oh, I got a couple more notes here. So to be uh, banning pines, cedar, and eucalyptus altogether as species is extremely short-sighted. Um, palm for the most part, are pretty bad. Um, there's palm trees that are, are popsicled up and are just green at the top, but um, pines, there's, for example, uh, there's a Norfolk pine, which is ultimately fireproof. It wilts, it doesn't create embers, it doesn't catch on fire. Um, to ban those would be very short-sighted. Um, there's different cedars as well, uh, and there's eucalyptus that don't shed, that are very uh, thinned out, that create canopies and create shade for the environment below, hold moisture in the ground. Uh, I, there's a lot of things on here that are really short-sighted and I really urge you guys to kick this down the road and actually deliberate this, but first put into, a, um, into the same codes, if you're planning on codifying this, that zero to five foot zone principle with the house. Um, 
because that's exponentially more important. If there's one element of a house, it doesn't matter what you do with the vegetation. If there's one weak element of a house, an ember literally from five miles away can come and burn a house down. And somebody that feels like they've done their best is actually has a false sense of security because they said, oh, I, my vegetation was 10 feet away from each other and sparsely, uh, you know, 300 feet away from my house. It's not gonna do anything. And, and I don't want to sell more false hope to people around this idea of defensible space. Houses need to stop burning down by preventing them from being ignitable. And dealing with it, dealing with it at a vegetation um, level is just, it's, it's pretty low on the priority list. So that's what I gotta say, thank you. Thank you. Council comments? I'm just going to start off by saying Jefferson and I had this as a racist, as you guys know. It took a long time, and there's a lot of stuff in it. Well, I'd like to kind of get the benefit of your comments on the quality of the stuff that's in it, since you spent a lot of time on it. Um, Jay, you want to start off on that? Certainly. Thank you, Skyler. I also did additional research. I didn't know how to propose this, but um, a book here is available. I'm not pitching the book. It's book for people to read. Um, I did have a time, uh, the time to spend in this book. Uh, I went out, this is an outside resource. Okay, well, a number of council members uh, are aware of it, but I kind of went like this as a guideline because this is his second book, and it seemed to be pragmatic and informative, and uh, that's some of the decision-making that we made at Zeracis uh, was included in, in that. Uh, and some of this material that's in here was also included in the Planning Commission's uh, review and work that they did. But going into the very details of which kind of pine, which kind of palm uh, is not for this evening because we could argue on, in, over anything. Best thing we can do is try and reduce the uh, outside fence perimeter and keep that at either five or six feet. Uh, it's Sheriff Via Nueva, uh, if somebody wants clarification. Um, and at that meeting, he did say a high fence is a high probability that we can't get our deputies to see as they drive by and uh, expect that the house that has the higher fence and the higher hedge is the one that will get hit before the one that doesn't have a high hedge or a high fence. Those were his comments. So. That was at the Duke's meeting. Uh, the Planning Commission spent a lot of time. I watched the Planning Commission meeting, uh, and they did a great deal of detail work, and I thought that that's what we would be seeing. Um, I know staff has to interpret and formulate and do the conjugation of what the Planning Commission has done, and I understand that, and that's, that's what you do. Uh, somewhere in there, we have to find a decision-making process for us to agree on and move forward. But um, at Zeracis, Skyler and I did put all these questions out and they did go back to the Planning Commission. Thank you, Jefferson. Skyler, do you have any Zeracis Okay, comments? so, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of plants, trees, et cetera. Um, I think that some of the points that were brought up by the public comments tonight you know, definitely focusing on the zone that's immediately adjacent to the house. It's probably less of a priority as you get further away. Um, but the palm tree is a contentious item. Some people do really love their palm trees, but they seem to function as uh, ember emitting sparklers in terms of a wired fire and probably would advise that we uh, remove those from being able to be planted um, in the city. Um, if you go and you pick apart some of the trees and stuff, I mean, I think they're not gonna have as big of an impact on a home, provided they're a certain distance away from the home. I think a lot of the, the, the shrubs and stuff have more of an issue in the closer proximity to the home. So, you know, those are things that we can, you know, go over item by item or I don't, you know, that's kind of how we did it at Ceresis. We just kind of went, you know, down a list and took it like that. If we want to do that now, we can do that. That may be the best approach. I'll let Karen decide what she wants to do. If, if we want to sit here and go through it item by item, we can do that. Well, uh, can I make a comment? 
that okay? Please. Yeah. Uh, this is really important. I appreciate all the comments from everybody who's come here, and I'm. I think that you know, the, if we look forward, this, the resiliency of the town and the survivability of the town should Woolsey Fire 2.0 come rolling over the hills, you know, 10 years from now, um, it starts right at the home. And I agree with Keegan. It's a lot of it is what the home is constructed of. But it's not really what we're talking about here. Uh, the next line of defense is how your yard is configured. So I do think this stuff is very important. And I appreciate all the, the work that's gone into it, both from Zeracis and Planning Commission, et cetera. Jerry Vandermeulen, I would like, if you wouldn't mind, come to the podium. Give us your two cents. Let us know how much you have um, reviewed it, if at all or had any input on it, and if you have any commentary, because this is probably one of those things that either we should have Jerry go over in detail, if not, if he hasn't done already, and maybe even bring in some of the LA County, you know, we got like the fire behavior guru uh, and Battalion 5 that if he can go give it the once over, or maybe they already have, I don't know. Well, I was just gonna, as Jerry was approaching, I mentioned that we have coordinated um, uh, not, forensically with the uh, county fire staff um, on this and Jessica has worked with Jerry on it as well. So we, um, I don't want you to feel like we haven't done our homework. We've tried to balance doing our homework with um, getting this back to the council as fast as possible since this had been a priority <coughs> item uh, for you uh, even before we started the work plan program. But it definitely was a, a priority issue on the work plan and um, we recognize that the building hardening aspect of this is also really important. Um, and that is something that if you want to add that as a task uh, for us to work with building safety on, it may fall more into their court than planning. Um, we're certainly happy to, to um, take that on. It wasn't part of what we were trying to address here. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, one thing that we're also mindful of is that education is going to be a huge part of this. I mean, before people, you know, you can put anything you want on a landscape plan, but um, over time, people are going to pay attention to the things they think are important. And so I think um, a continuous sort of education campaign about how to maintain your landscaping and um, what, what will make your property more um, fire safe and stuff will go a lot further than just having rules in the book. And so that's that was also something we had in mind when we put this together. No, I think you make a really good point and uh, I wanted to comment on that because I do think what we're talking about is kind of a cultural shift, you know. And so in the future, rather than going over to a guy's house and saying, dude, those are nice palm trees. In the future, you go, dude, you have palm trees? What's wrong with this picture? You know, like everybody knows you're not supposed to have those. And I'm, I'm making light of it, but in reality, you know, as everyone gets more aware of the things that are really dumb to have at your house, be it railroad ties or whatever, then there's more of a, it's kind of like, you know, in the 60s when they did that no littering campaign, people used to actually just chuck things out of their car and not really think about it. And then after a while, it was like, it was really successful. So that's the kind of thing that I think is quite, but I did want to have, let Jerry at least give us some comments on his perspective on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, just to clarify, uh, as Bonnie stated, uh, I did not provide a written report on this or any background or any information. Um, I did corroborate though uh, in providing some background information, for instance, on the, the mulch, a mulch study that was done up in the Tahoe area. And then I dug up some information that I shared from uh, Ventura County Fire in regard to some of their stuff. So um, as Keegan stated, uh, and I, I've done 126 assessments now citywide, uh, I completed last year. And so as I'm going to these houses, you know, you're hard pressed to have people start tearing out their landscaping. So it really does come down to the maintenance and it's keeping stuff trimmed up off the ground because typically uh, trees and stuff are going to burn from the ground up and left unattended eucalyptus trees, pine trees, limbs are going to touch the ground. You're going to get ground fire. And then either through ladder fuels, through shrubs getting into the low hanging trees or the trees themselves touching the ground, that's generally gonna happen. So a lot of this does come into uh, maintenance and just keeping stuff clean. Uh, and I really, really do emphasize that first five feet as well uh, as building construction. 
Um, and those are definitely the key points. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Appreciate yeah. your input. You bet. Thank you, Jerry. Mikey? Okay. Um, well, thanks for everyone's work on all this so far. I'm, uh, I was reading through this, I was thinking about Australia right now. It seems like in the last year, a lot of people have pointed to the amazing things they've done in Australia that are far ahead of where we are on fire resiliency and protection. And right now they've had 14 million acres burned down and nothing they've done has worked at all. So um, overall, so I think actually a few things have worked, but they, the fires are going to come, as was said very eloquently. We're not going to stop the fires. We have to build homes that decide not to burn down as, as opposed to our typical home we have now in my neighborhood so I think looking at this and I discussed it with Karen briefly earlier is that this is me ongoing we need to make a stab at this this is really big so I think we should try and hit the key points and I think someone else said already find the key points and discuss them and vote on those and and at least get through that this is this is a I mean, we could spend we could spend days on this really it's it's an overwhelming issue um, and back to one point that Keegan made, I, I want to say in a slightly different way. When it comes to plants, really at the end of the day, it's healthy plants. Healthy, well-maintained plants don't burn your neighborhood down. Un ground debris, plants that aren't taken care of, burn your neighborhood down. So um, there's a lot more than we, we can codify all we want. But yes, the public education part um, is really important because in fighting the fires in Malibu West, I was really surprised that the um, eucalyptus did not burst into flames. It absolutely confused me. And I know they did in other places, and I went there and I looked at them, and there was a ton of debris where those trees burned, and they burned hot, and they caused a lot of damage. And I was like, ah, I see, I see. But I, I will certainly, if anyone wants to make a motion on palm trees, Yes, I think Mazda said it. they were an absolute nightmare during the fire. Even ones that were decently well-maintained, once they get into that inside part of it, it's just like a flamethrower that you can't do anything about in my experience. So anyhow, um, Mayor, I trust your, your, your great common wisdom and sense in figuring out how we walk through this. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Um, does anybody have any particular item they want pulled out of this? Well, but I think that we should consider the full palm tree ban. I think we're all in agreement on that. Is anybody opposed to the palm tree issue? I don't even know of any palm trees that are less than six feet tall. Well, you put a six foot tree in and it becomes 12 and 15 feet and you then don't have there it is. Palm. So if you ban it, you, you ban them right away. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I would support that. I, um, one question, though. Is there, and maybe I don't know anything about palm trees other than they, they light on fire really easily. Um, isn't there, is there a native one? Isn't there one native palm, and is, does it burst into flames? I have no idea. No, I'm all sure those there date is. palms sure were imported from the Middle East by the Department of Agriculture in the 40s. Okay. There you go. That answers that. And the fan palms and the queen palms are the most uh, easy to catch fire and maintain their fire brands as they fly off because I sat through that for almost 10 hours where the queen palm uh, survived a little better because it had more moisture. It was a fruit producing palm where the fan palms and the queen palms uh, do not produce fruit and they're of no use to the pollinators or to anybody. So if you're going to do it, make a motion, make a motion. <laughs> Uh, excuse me one second Bo Bonnie or Jessica do you have an answer for that is there a native palm the only thing that that we could think of would be something that might be native to um, like the California desert areas but not necessarily to the mountain regions okay thank you okay so it looks like there is consensus moving forward with the palm ban where's the yeah. palm ban in the resolution the, the bulk of the um, the uh, standards, um, if you look at, it's page 33 of the overall agenda item, but it, as far as ordinance number 461 goes, starting on page 14 of 19, that's where the list of different standards start. 
Are palm Actually. trees listed? Palm tre okay, so just instead of uh, for C1A, uh, palm trees are prohibited rather than palm trees with potential to grow over six feet in height are prohibited. Would that be the change? Right. Yes. Okay. It's on page 33 of the report, page 14 of 16 of the ordinance. If you look at the top right corner of Ordinance 461, page 14 of it. But maybe we should just talk about like the bigger concepts that are in this that are kind of outlined as the key features of the ordinance and we can kind of, you know, obviously we think that it should apply citywide for all new and updated landscaping plans. Everyone's in agreement on that. Is and that already in place? One of, yes, and that, that would include also the fire rebuild projects. That yes, was that was probably a okay. key element to be included in this. And that's already part of the ordinance, right, Bonnie? Okay. Um, I had, a question. I had a question about the solid fence thing. What's that all about? I mean, is that different than fences as they are now? What's up, what, what's well, I that think wording? The, the sort of the concept with that was like, let's say a, a, a brick fence or a center block wall that has a facade or a port in place concrete fence is likely not to burn, whereas a wood fence has a high potential to burn. And so what are we saying, no wood fences? No, I mean, I don't think that we have to say no wood fences. I think that we can encourage the use of the other ones, or we can say no wood fences. I mean, we all know, you know, so, everybody so has the, wood fences. There's a lot of wood fences here. There are a lot less money to build. Yeah, I was just talking about the, the solid versus, you know, view so, permeable. Yeah, so um, one element that is in the recommended ordinance that the Planning Commission agreed with was um, any fencing between, correct me if I say this wrong, between, um, zero and five feet from the house would need to be non-flammable. Um, and then another component of fencing that, that I think maybe you're referring to is that staff had discussed and proposed um, an option to allow someone to build a six foot solid uh, fence if it is non-flammable in their front yard where today you could only have 42 inches um, solid and then the, the distance between 42 inches and 72 inches has to be view permeable. And um, the reason was to encourage a, um, a non-flammable fence first. And then also um, it actually, I think, could assist with um, code enforcement with respect to oversized hedges. Um, people are more, I think, likely to agree to uh, maintain their hedge at a, an appropriate height or get rid of it altogether if they could have a six foot solid fence. Um, there's people, we just hear over and over again that people want privacy and I understand that um, Sheriff Villanueva um, had concerns about solid fences, but the reality is there's an awful lot of solid fencing and hedges all over town and um, so this was a, a mechanism to, number one, encourage a non-flammable fence and also hopefully have a tool to um, get people to eliminate oversized hedges if they could, you know, know that somebody couldn't see directly into their property. Uh, you know, that you make a great point because all those freaking ficus things are like 10, 12 feet tall and they're driving, you know, a lot so, of views are, are going because of them. So would a ficus be removed because it can grow taller than 25 feet, like under the... No, but what I'm saying is that maybe they'll go for the fence instead of the bushes. But that was, we, we talked about this a bit at Zeracis and there's sort of, you know, yeah, we don't want to change the neighborhood or something like that in regards to it. But I think that if you can incentivize t to get someone to build a non-flammable fence, that that's wise. What's the current ordinance propose? It's not part of the proposed okay. ordinance. So there's no change to the to to the no. um, fence standards at this point. So if you want to make a change, then you would need to amend it. Okay. Leave it the way that it is. Um, we're all in agreement on the defensible five foot 
distance, and that obviously addresses, there's a partial fence. Well, there was there. one thing about, um, does that five feet start from the eaves, or does it start from, like, the wall of the house? Where did, where did you come to a conclusion on that? The staff recommends from the we eaves? We propose that it would be from the eaves, eaves yeah. overhangs. Eve, Eve sure. I agree. Yes, we have consensus on that. Highly flammable trees within 50 feet of a structure. I think it's good the way they have it. You know, those trees are, are can serve, a, can actually serve a good purpose as long as they're right ne not right next to the house. You know, they do provide some bit of filtering and shielding from the rain of embers, but if they should get you on fire and they're near the house, then they can be a big problem. So I think it's good the way they are in. Yeah, I agree. And, and Keegan, and particularly what I've learned from his mom, makes a great point. Those those big trees, they cool the earth. They they retain moisture if they're well. And of course, the education Bonnie mentioned, if they're well maintained, it's it's a totally different story. If they're just allowed to overgrow and they're underwater, then then that's another issue. It probably most of the trees that are over 50 foot tall are in that just grow area a lot of the time, unfortunately, because I don't see the tree trimmers at 50 feet high. Occasionally on the Ukes. Does anybody have any particular, other particular items they'd like flagged? Not me. So, so we're good on the, the max heights for the trees near the power lines? Yeah, let's talk about or the, the, the species lines. that are planted in those areas. Yeah, yeah, I'm personally, I think there shouldn't be any trees anywhere near the freaking power lines, but I don't think we're ready for that yet. Yeah, that was one thing the Planning Commission discussed um, at length. Um, there was concern that in, um, in some properties, especially smaller lots, if you have a lot of utility easements and power lines going on, going on if, you, if you started to prohibit too many things, then you would end up with no tree canopy at all. And so... Um, they did discuss um, this a lot. Mikey, you look like you had something to add? No. Okay. Okay, so are we ready to make a motion? We're ready. I'll make a motion incorporating the changes that we listed. That would be ordinance number to approve ordinance number 461, an ordinance of the city of Malibu determining the project is categorically exempt from CEQA and amending the local coastal program, local implementation plan, chapter three zoning designations and permitted uses, and chapter two definitions and Malibu Municipal Code Title 17 zoning to foster the creation of fire resistant landscapes and repealing ordinances numbers 343 and 356, deleting Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 9.22, Landscape Water Conservation, establishing Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 17.53, Landscape Water Conservation and Fire Protection, and amending Malibu Municipal Code Section 16.24.020 to, I think there's a typo there, to eliminate uh, reference to Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 9.22, and then on page 14, to alter C1A to state palm trees are prohibited. Uh, does that reflect your motion? There's a second. Thank you, Trevor. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And, and Sorry. are we going to, I guess we're coming to the mid-year, we can talk about making, uh, actually make our houses not burn down as easily. Maybe that's something we should think, talk about as we get there. Yeah, just an off, just a comment going forward. Okay. Moving on to item 6A. May we please have a staff report? Sure, I'll take this one. So we, uh, we have a very detailed staff report about this issue. It's a complicated legal issue. Uh, I hope everyone had a chance to, to review it. And I just want to point out a couple things in particular. Um, number one is the CVRA is counterintuitive. And, and just, beca just because a district wouldn't solve, uh, wouldn't result in a majority-minority district does not mean that there isn't a violation of the CVRA. So 
even though we're in a city where we would not be able to create a district where there'd be a majority minority, that doesn't mean that we can avoid um, necessarily moving to districts. It wouldn't actually, under the CVRA, the standard is whether there's racially polarized voting in the city, and that means that the minority vote's different than the majority, and it's, it's, it's a law that's imposed by the state, it wasn't a choice by us, and it, it is what it is. Uh, the second point I wanna make is that uh, while this wasn't brought to the city in a way that we prefer and our hand was forced in terms of dealing with this issue, it's an important issue, and whether to move it to districts is a subject that deserves the attention of the whole community, and it's something that should be carefully considered by everyone out here, because it will be a significant change in how we're elected in the characteristics of the city and what this council will look like in the future. And that uh, number three, that the recommendation here is to embark on a course of action to bring the community together to look at maps and, and uh, what that would potentially look at and what districts would look at and bring the community in and potentially put this on the ballot and to bring in input. So if there are further questions, I'm happy to get into it, but that's, those are sort of the, the big points I think we should look at it when we're dealing with this issue. There are a few options to the city. I got a question. Thank you, Trevor. So this was brought to the city's attention by um, Milton Grimes and just a letter from him. Not, so just for the benefit of everyone out there, it's, it, it's not something that a resident complained to the city about that they'd been, you know, disenfranchised or whatever, for want of a better word. It's not, it's not something that has ever been brought to the attention that I'm aware of, city um, council or anybody. I brought it to the city council. Well, you brought it to it for For, for discussion to see if it wanted discussion. to move forward and council decided right. not to. But it's not, it hasn't been brought to us in terms of somebody feels like there's a minority group that is not getting their voting voice heard, so to speak. I'm not aware of any complaints from any, um, particularly individuals other than Mr. Grimes' letter. And as you know, that starts a process that could potentially lead to litigation. Yeah, I understand that. And it, we, you're right, we did consider it before. And, it, and in terms of the school separation thing, it was a suggested uh, to us as kind of a methodology for us to get more of um, lever, leverage with our um, compadres at this in Santa Monica on school district issues. And it was explained to me, and I, I'll be honest with you, at the time I didn't really see that it gave us much of an advantage. But anyway, that's it. Now we have a difference because they're being forced to go to district-based elections, but Smala still does not have district-based <laughs> elections. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Okay, we have speaker slips. Uh, Craig Hill, followed by Norm Haney, followed by John Mazza, and I'll call the others after that. Use my pen. Uh, I imagine you'll, you're heading towards putting this on the ballot, though of course I'm not privy to your del deliberations. I studied Mr. Grimes' letter. Must say that the evidence he cites actually runs counter to his assertions. In the last census in Santa Monica, Hispanics of any race were 13.1 percent, more than twice that of Salib Malibu 6.1. By the math I showed in my previous comment, that difference makes all the difference, and Santa Monica is no precedent for us here. As Grimes' letter points out, quote, the CVRA requires only that a plaintiff show the existence of ra racially polarized voting. He can't provide evidence of that in Malibu. In the first instance, this is because there are so few Hispanics here that the statistical likelihood of one running for office is low. In the second instance, he suggests that when a city hasn't had a Hispanic candidate, votes on certain race-related propositions can serve as proxies. Prop 187, 209, and 229, by which he means 227. The only evidence he offers are the winning percentages of those propositions in Malibu. So let's look at them. Prop 187 barely passed at 50.9%, yet 23% of Hispanics overall voted in favor of it. So those that voted in favor were more than enough to help it to win. While race was a factor in the size of the margins, it wasn't and could not have been dispositive of the outcome. Similarly, 25% of Hispanics overall voted for Prop 209. In Malibu, it passed at only 54%. And then Prop 227 passed at 60% overall, a higher margin, 
but with a full 40% Hispanic vote, you can't say that the vote met the standard of being racially polarized. It's 40%, that's, that's a mid number. In those three all important ballot propositions that Mr. Grimes singles out, there's no way that Malibu's 6% of Hispanics could have made a whit of difference. So he's categorically incorrect on the sole evidence he's put forward. Um, incidentally, Prop 227, which had the effect of eliminating many, many bilingual classes, was repealed in 2016. So as an example of a potentially discriminatory measure, it's been mooted. He has shown no evidence that even leans in the direction of racially polarized voting here. There's no need to put this on the ballot right off. The city should win this on summary judgment or some similar threshold motion. If that were not to happen, then at that early point, you could cut your losses. So I, I'd say surely it's worth first risking some money on whatever that threshold motion might be to preserve the unity of our community. And if you lose at that point, only then do you need to look at the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Norm Haney, followed by John Mazza, followed by Christopher Carradine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to this item. First of all, I want to clear something up. The last time I spoke with regard to this item, I referenced that Lou Lamont uh, was on the city council for four years. Clearly, it was eight years, and I was mistaken on that. Um, it, it, uh, I really have a tremendous amount of respect for Lou and the amount of work uh, and effort he put into making this a, a better city. Um, with regard to the item directly, I'm against districting. I, I want everyone that runs for city council to be concerned about everyone's vote throughout the entire city in order to be elected. I don't want them concerned about only the items in their particular district in order to gain the vote for, from that district. I believe that that process is very polarizing and, and causes individual city council members to only represent the interest in their particular district because that's who they're representing. Um, I've seen that on on the uh, Board of Supervisors, and I don't agree that that's a good way to govern the general public. Uh, those are my comments. I, I think that Craig Hill made some very good comments, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got John Mazza, followed by Christopher Carradine, followed by Bruce Silverstein. Uh, good evening again. Um, you obviously, I've testified twice on this, you obviously know I don't like it. Um, Malibu was formed to protect our city from the county, basically. And now we're going to fight among ourselves. And we're going to disenfranchise people who want to participate in our government. And so that's just antithetical for what Malibu should be all about. So you have three choices, I guess. You have a choice. Well, first I want to point out that bill, that law was passed 19 years ago. It took 19 years for somebody to come in and try to shake us down, okay? We aren't the big plum out there that's so easy to win against. Uh, where were the other lawyers for 19 years? So, and I, of course, don't like shakedowns, but um, you have, you're saying that you have three choices. Just go along with it be done with it in district. Then you can all get recalled, I guess. <laughs> but number two is, oh, let the, the voters vote, vote for it in, I guess, November, but you're gonna spend all this money on demographics when we're in a census year. And we just had 20% of the house, the town burned down. Where are you gonna get decent demographic figures? You're gonna get them from the census. They're this year. They're starting right now. You can make 21 bucks an hour knocking on doors. You're not going to get them from last year because 20% of the town's gone. So then you have to, so you say, okay, well, let's vote on it. We'll spend all this money. And then if the vote doesn't pass, you get sued again. Okay, so you wasted all your money. By the way, you paid the guy 30 grand to go away, but he gets it again if it gets voted down. Now, there was some language in here about having something about a mayor included in this vote. 
But you know, as politicians, I believe that any decent campaign against this is going to win. It's just going to win. It's just too easy. It's too much of a no-brainer. The people in Malibu don't want to do this. And so you have a choice tonight, really, of voting to go put it on the ballot next year and spending a bunch of money. And I don't know how much it is, but I think somebody mentioned 400 grand for a demographer and all this kind of stuff and, and forming a district and all that. And then losing in November and starting all over again. And I think Craig Hill came up with the, the real idea is go for a summary judgment or whatever you do. If you lose that, have another meeting. But don't spend all this money. It's like spending money on an EIR for the park we never built. You know, we gave it back to Joe. It's, it's just wasted money. And realize that you have very little chance of this passing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Carradine. You have four minutes, followed by Bruce Silverstein, followed by Paul Grisanti. Good evening, all. Reba, Mayor, Council people. Um, I don't disagree with anything that's already been said. Here's the problem. The, the plaintiff uh, is a voting rights organization based uh, in East Los Angeles, and they propel these lawsuits um, using uh, California's Voter Rights uh, Protection Acts, uh, which date back to about 2000, 2001, 2002. The, uh, the lawyers that bring these cases on behalf of this plaintiff have won every single case. Um, Santa Monica is facing $21.4 million in lawyers' fees that they must reimburse by law. So here's your problem. You guys didn't ask for this. We as a city didn't ask for this. We don't discriminate. But that's not what is the meat of this issue. The meat of this issue is that it's a lawyer's paradise, and there's an opportunity for these folks to make a lot of money, particularly, particularly if we don't uh, make the right decision. And one of the decisions has a deadline tonight because there is a safe harbor clause in the law that allows you to pay this particular firm and its plaintiff $30,000, and they'll go away with the provision that you must then implement um, the district voting structure. Your second choice, which is to put it on the ballot, negates the safe harbor clause. So you no longer have the guarantee or the ability to just pay $30,000 and make it end. Yes, it will restructure Malibu's elections. The th another option, and the other option, is uh, to choose to fight. If you choose to fight, again, as I've just said, you're going to lose the safe harbor option. Um, and at the end of the day, um, it's a voting rights issue that's being raised. Whether or not we think it's specious and does not have a support in any kind of demographic that we have in this city and in the history of the city's behavior, it matters little. Because any court in this country is not going to touch a voting rights issue that disfavors a voting rights claim. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bruce Silverstein, followed by Paul Grisanti, followed by Kevin Shankman. Good evening, everybody. So um, there are kind of two issues before you. Um, one is just as a matter of what's best for Malibu, and I don't mean in terms of litigation issues. Do you think this makes sense? Do you think that having voting districts, districts as opposed to voting at large is a good thing for the public at large? That's a great thing to talk about. You've heard various um, views. I don't, I don't have a view on that. The other issue is a legal issue. I think it is foolish to be discussing that publicly, period, full stop. You have the right to discuss that in private, and you shouldn't be making assertions any, any one of you making assertions about the legal detriment of not taking an action because that's going to be used against you if there is litigation. You should be discussing with counsel the merits of the claim. You should be discussing with counsel the legal strategy with regard to the merits because nothing is clear ever. And you should be doing all that privately because every time you open your mouth in public, and you've been doing it about all kinds of other issues, the, the effect of the Martin decision, 
issues about what the Coastal Commission laws are. You shouldn't be having those discussions here in public. As much as the Brown Act favors everything, many things in public, and I favor many things in public, there are certain things that should not be said in public because they have precedential effect against you, against us, the city. So I'm also against shakedowns. And um, you should be making this decision not based on whether you're being shaken down, but on the merits. The only thing I do know about the merits, and I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer in this case. By the way, I, I've been litigating high stakes, very expensive litigation for 30 years. And I would never let my clients talk about the merits, the legal issues publicly. There are things that can be said publicly. There are other things that shouldn't. But I also, this does not make sense to me as a legal matter despite the fact that they've won the cases they've picked. This is a, um, it's, it's a form letter that's now going out because of some successes in the past. Um, but it doesn't make sense here, the arguments, I've read them. If anything, going to districts in Malibu would dilute whatever voting power any block of minorities might have, because right now they're dispersed throughout the area. And if you vote, in, if you, they could actually maybe combine and elect somebody. But if they didn't, if you, if you create districts, that group power gets diluted. It makes no sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our last two speakers are Paul Grisanti and Kevin Shankman. <laughs> Good evening again, and thank you so much for staying for this. Uh, like a lot of people I've talked to, I'm offended by the assertion that we are in some way a town that has caused people to feel disenfranchised. Uh, and the last speaker made the point that the minorities we have here are pretty much evenly dispersed within the community. And I can't imagine any, any districts being created that would enable that to enable them to have more influence than they have now. Uh, but being as practical as I am and seeing the calculus of do we want to be Palmdale or do we want to be somebody who paid 30000 and then spent another 400000 passing this and having me give up the ability to vote every two years and not only get to cast one vote every four years in exchange for that? I'm not happy about having less representation for me or less representation for any of you. I think that that, you know, over the last 30 years, every city council has really tried to represent everybody in the community. And if we're gonna end up like Italy in the 18, early 1800s where every city was a city state and they had battles against each other, and we'll see the battle between the Point Dumians against the Big Rockians <laughs> as, and start building our towers to defend our districts, you know, that doesn't sound that great either. And I don't envy you your decision on this. And I really don't think there's a good answer here because we have a legal shakedown system in effect and that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Kevin Shankman. So everyone's an expert on everything with dystopian ideas about what would happen in Malibu if, if our election system were to change. Some of the comments here today make me think back about two years when I was sitting across a table from Lane Dilg, who's the Santa Monica city attorney, and she said to me, your case is frivolous. We will not settle for any electoral structure change. Tens of millions of dollars later, Lane Dilg was proven wrong. And I hope that you all take that to heart. Now, Trevor and Christy, they may not be voting rights experts, but they at least know how to look at a scoreboard. And the scoreboard right now reads about 30 to zero. Now on a more positive note, and I, I, I was hesitant to even go there um, because I'd like this to be a more uh, friendly process. Um, and. <laughs> 
Yes, really. We came here to have a discussion about district election. That discussion was turned down. And I'm sorry, members of the council, but if, if I'm getting comments from, from behind me, I got to address those comments behind me. Now, I do want to I do want to make a couple corrections to some of the things that were said about going forward. Demographer cost. Um, I think someone, a couple people mentioned 400,000. It's not 400,000. Okay. There's really only one decent demographer in Southern California. It's David Ely with Compass Demographics, and we're talking more like 20 to 25,000. And then the other number that was mentioned, $21.4 million from, uh, that, that Santa Monica uh, is, gonna, is, is into for the plaintiff's counsel, that's wrong too. It's actually 22.3, not 21.4. So, you know, I, I, I see city council meetings all over the, the state of California because this is what I specialize in, and I reside in Malibu. And you know what? That's the reason that this has not come to this council before is because I reside here. I hesitated to ever allow any of my colleagues to send that letter. But it has been sent now, and the council really needs to simply follow the law. Now, I know there's been discussions about a ballot measure, and maybe that's an option, and that's something that, you, that, that Trevor and Christy and, and the council can deal with Mr. Grimes on. But ultimately, the city of Malibu is going to need to go to district elections. It's not, it, we don't want to be in the position of Santa Monica. We tried to warn them, it didn't work, and look where they are now. Thank you. Do we have any council comments? Okay, I'll take uh, I'll take the first swing at this. Um, I'd like to address one of the speakers, uh, Bruce Silverstein, that um, oftentimes as a council we're accused of not sharing our deliberations with our general pub public and our population. And in essence, what we've been trying to do the last couple of years is share as much of the decision-making and the process of decision-making we can with our general population. So if we are honest and we are open, hopefully all attorneys see that process. And the burden on those attorneys attacking our openness and our freedoms to share our decision-making with our public should also be administered to those law firms. And I know it's not good counsel, but it's a hard act to follow when you're open and honest with your population. That's why we went this route, to bring it out and let people help us make that decision for them. Because one way or another, we're going to be fighting it, and I'd like to have the public know exactly what we're doing. I just want to take a whack at it, and I'm sure my other council members will have their feelings to tell you about as well. Who'd like to go next? Uh, I'll make a comment. I think uh, it's disheartening to hear that bringing something forward to a vote of the people that live in this town is a bad idea and will not satisfy the town legally. It's just disheartening. I mean, it's a big issue. It's a really big issue. And people, we the, the way the law works, we had 45 days to deal with it over the holidays. Unbelievable. After the largest natural disaster in our history. It's unconscionable. But here we are with no apologies and deal with it. So it's hard not to see it as a shakedown. And I know Kevin said, and I've talked with him, that you know he wanted to talk about the good side of this. It's a hard way to enter into a good side of a conversation when there simply wasn't any way to do that at a time when we had no city council meetings or anything like that. So I find it very disheartening that we can't even apparently enter into a conversation over having the city, city input, the citizens input on this. So I, I find that, that that's, a, that's a hard pill to swallow. That's all I got for now. 
Yeah, I think this is a solution in search of, <laughs> in search of a problem. But rather than talk about it, you know, we're uh, between a rock and a hard place. So why don't you spell out what our options are in terms of what's in here and the, the various courses of action that we could take tonight? Sure. So um, option one is to adopt the exact language to remain in the safe harbor. And that would include um, stating that the city has the intent the intent to adopt an ordinance to transition to at-large elections. It wouldn't bind us if we literally move off it, but it would say that we have the intent to move to them, and then we would have a series of public hearings, and um, the public would come in and comment about this, maps, uh, we'd hire a demographer, and we'd bring in maps, and people would look at the maps, and then we'd see what it looks like, and then the council would have the choice to adopt those maps and move to um, district elections. Or uh, another option that's been discussed is potentially putting it on the ballot. So once the maps are created, then you can make the decision then if you want to remain within the strict part of the safe harbor, or you can put something very close to what the, the exact language of the safe harbor is and say that the intent is to um, to adopt uh, to put the, to put this matter on the ballot, or to either adopt it. Um, or put it on the ballot. You could use some language along those lines. So basically you have two options there in terms of the resolution. Both of those would lead to the same process of a number of public hearings, hiring a demographer, putting the maps together, seeing what those look like. And then there's a short window, 90 days, um, for the safe harbor. And a decision would need to, need to be made within that period of time about uh, moving to districts. Or the other option is to, is to say, ignore it, ignore the letter, and see if the city gets sued. So on the on the two ballot options, you've differentiated a little bit. One is sort of, hey, should we uh, look at possibly constructing something like this? And the other one is come to them with the actual uh, thing with districts, et cetera, in it that we would be voting on. Well, what we're doing is this resolution here, either way, it sets up a process that's gonna go into effect in terms of the public hearings that will be required and the demographer and the maps will be created. It's exactly the same what will happen. The difference is in the language of the intent of the council. So section three sort of lays out the, the two proposals right here. The first is the city council intends to adopt an ordinance to transition the election to city, of its city council members from at large to district based. And the second says the city council intends to place a binding initiative on the ballot to transition to the, um, the city council from at large to district based. So those are the two options or we could put something sort of in the middle that says the city intends to do it large or um, put it on the, on the ballot. Okay, or do nothing and roll the dice. Exactly. Okay, uh, you know, I, I always say we should be doing things that are needs driven. You know, there should be an identified need for like, like the skateboard guys on a skate park. There's a definite need for a skate park there. So we respond to the skateboard guys. There's um, 480 homes that burned down. There's a need to address the landscaping and make it safer and make our buildings uh, safer. Those are needs identified by the community and action taken in response to the needs of the community. And uh, this, I haven't heard this as a need coming from the community, but I certainly wanna hear what the community has to say about it. So if we're gonna do something like this, you know, in my opinion, and in Mr. Grimes' letter, he talks about, you know, Congress and stuff like that. But comparing us to Congress is, I think it's ridiculous. It's 300 million people and 2,500 uh, miles from coast to coast, as opposed to a town of 13,000, where it's actually literally possible to know everybody in town. I think that the, the issues for me are cohesion issues. You know, we... Um, we, as a long, skinny town with a bunch of different neighborhoods, should be doing things to enhance our cohesion. And I don't see this personally. I'm not an expert on voting, but I don't see this as something that enhances the cohesion. It would probably make, as a candidate, it would probably make it cheaper and simpler, a lot easier, much easier and cheaper to run for public office. And I think that uh, selfishly, that would be an, an easy thing to do. But I think that the strength of our town is, is the is all of Malibu is one tribe, you know. That's we're all we're all the same tribe, and I the idea of Skyler coming 
and saying, hey, this is good for Point Doom, and somebody else come and saying, well, this is better, good for Big Rock. We have never heard that type of discussion here. And I think that uh, from my perspective, I, it doesn't seem like a good way to go because I think we should be doing things to enhance our cohesion. So before we would move ahead on something that I think is pretty significant in the way we do the most important thing, which is elect, elect our elected officials, we should certainly get input from the community, whether it be a vote or you know a, a series of workshops, et cetera. And this is, I don't think this is something that we would even be talking about if there weren't some, you know, there you have it right there. There's the guy with the threatening of something about $20 million. So we have to do it. It's not something that's been identified by the community. So unfortunately, here we are. You know, we're trying to put the town back together. We're trying to rebuild 480 homes. We're trying to make things safer. We're trying to deal with all the RVs on PCH. We're trying to deal with the Coast Commission. We're trying to deal with Caltrans. We've got a lot of things on our plates. We've got some people right here working on trying to build, rebuild their homes. And now we have this to deal with. So if we're going to do this type of thing, we owe it to the people to bring them into the discussion and to let them hear their voice. And that's, I think, a, I think it's a wise course of action. I appreciate it. You know that um, suggestion. Those are my comments. Thank you, Rick Skyler. Do you have any comments? <clears throat> um, I think that the idea of you know going full steam ahead with the democratic process is. Uh, I would like to see that that would be the only way that something like this would work, where you'd put it forth to all the voters and they would decide what they do in their community. But I very much understand that that's not the way that the state laws have been set up on this. And I think that we have um, our challenges, you know, ahead of it. I would, you know, so curious to see what everybody else wants to say, but I don't want to put us in a position like Santa Monica by any means. Um, not that I think that the council would, but um, that's where it's at. Thank you. I think this is a really sad day for Malibu. It's really sobering to see this kind of leverage taken against us and by a resident. It, in my opinion, this is a tragedy. Um, Mr. Carradine, I heard everything you said, and I read your letter before you spoke tonight. I hear you. But it's a sad state of affairs for us. The night I was sworn in, I used a phrase, stronger together. This city is stronger together. It's geographically extremely spread out. It's not a dense city, 13,000 residents over how many square miles? Um, so in my opinion, going down this road weakens us as a city and has the potential, the predictable potential to pit one council member against another and one geographic region against another. And that's really too bad. Um, and a comment that Mr. Shankman made, uh, he referred to plaintiff's counsel in the Santa Monica case. Uh, with a $22 million judgment or uh, ask in the works right now, and I realize it's under appeal. And um, I just want to clarify, plaintiff's counsel is you. Thank you. So we've looked at the options. We've talked about them. We've met twice in closed session about this. 
And I think this is the worst position the city's been put in. Um, and, and by a community member. So that's really, really unfortunate for all involved. So, um, I would like to think that the people of Malibu would like their voice to be heard on this, and I think they deserve that. And I realize it hasn't been handled that way before. But I think putting this on the ballot is a good idea. And, and if it's a good idea for the city, then I think the people will come to that conclusion. So those are my remarks. Mayor, if I just may add that I want, and I'm pretty sure that everyone's fully aware of this, but just because this item would go to the ballot, even if it's voted down, by no means is any guarantee that the lawsuit can't move forward and the city can lose and you have to go to district elections. So I just want to put that out there and make sure that everyone is completely and fully aware of it. Um, that that's something that, if not phased now, could very well be phased in a year. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you, Skyler. Uh, additionally, at that juncture, a year from now, if the council chooses to go that route, uh, um, at least we allowed the people that will be paying that bill the opportunity to weigh in. And I think that's where all of us are headed is, hey, let's talk to our, our the people that put us up here on this dais and see what they're thinking and, and get their deep thoughts on this. I'd rather have that behind me in a defensive position if the lawyer's fees go over a million than not have it. And I know Bruce Silverstein's back there saying, boy, he's just letting the cat out of the bag. But once again, this is a, this council has worked together pretty well for the last couple of years. And I would like to see that continue. And the benefit is that the people should hear the deliberations despite what other councils may choose not to tell or not to reveal, we're open here. And I'd rather have an open voting public behind me paying the bills to the attorneys. And that's what, that's my final statement. Thank you. Yeah, I think if, you know, uh, let's take Mr. Shankman at his word. You know, he, he's, he's it, um, advised us not to be um, afraid of change and that some of his previous uh, cities he's dealt with now that they're district elections that they, that they like it so I think it, as a resident of the community and as somebody who is an advocate for this then certainly he and anybody else who's in favor of this can make the case to the public and maybe maybe we're wrong and maybe there is a, a lot of support for this. And if, if there's enough support for this on a ballot and that's what the voters want, then I'm comfortable with it. Uh, I don't feel that way now. But uh, hey, you know, you're a resident, you're an expert on this. And I think you, if you, between now and the time the voters vote on it, let make your case and uh, let's see how the public goes. And I think that's the best way to do it. I, that's, I wouldn't feel good about changing this without a lot of public uh, discussion and input. And I really think that the people need to decide this one, really. Okay, do we have any other comments, questions? Okay. I guess we're looking for a proposal here in a second, and uh, I guess it would be the language uh, that the counselor will uh, explain to us. Sure. So the question, I think it sounds like there's momentum here to conduct the hearings, hire the demographer, look at the maps. Is that correct? So we're looking to adopt a resolution here. And then the, it comes down to whether you want to stick strictly within the safe harbor, which would mean saying the intention is to adopt an ordinance pursuant to Government Code 34886 um, to the election of its city council members transition from an at-large electoral system to a district-based system. Or we could say it declares its intention to do that, or 
place a binding initiative on the ballot for the 2020 general election. So we could leave. And if you do option two, you lose the safe harbor. Potentially. It's close to the safe harbor, but it is not exactly within the safe harbor. I might add that the, the safe harbor violation is the is a point where the Grimes concern could say, here's a wedge. But for me and for many of the people in Malibu who have spoken to me about this, let them go outside safe harbor and bring that lawsuit during safe harbor. And if we don't have the safe harbor, if we're just winging this on our own, at least we're making the attempt. And it looks a lot better in court when you've made the attempt to try and accommodate the lawsuit. And so I would rather have the burden on the plaintiff than on our shoulders. So I think option two uh, is, the, is the better one, just from my opinion. Okay, to clarify that would state that um, the intention is to adopt an ordinance to put it on the ballot or to place it uh, a binding initiative on, that's what you would want? what the council wants, but I think at this point we have to really write this correctly, and I'm looking to you to write it to okay. the fact that says, I don't care about safe harbor, and I think Okay, or you want to go with p just purely was put on the ballot only, we have yeah. no intention. We're, we're, I think everyone's on the same okay. mind that we want to put it before the voters. Didn't want to speak for everybody, that's why I was looking to, to get this language I'll make that motion. Codified. Okay, so in that sense, then the uh, then the choice is to, each of these three sections has a, has two parts. You would adopt the second part in each one. So the motion would be to adopt resolution 2002, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Malibu finding the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, directing the retention of our demographer and directing a schedule be brought back to take actions related to district-based elections in accordance with Elections Code Section 10010A and declaring its intention to place a binding initiative on the ballot for the 2020 general municipal election as to whether to transition to district-based elections. And then in section three, you'll adopt the second um, clause, which says the city council intends to place a binding initiative on the ballot for the 2020 general municipal elections to transition the election of its city council members from at large electoral system to a district-based system with five council members elected by district as provided by government code section 34871A. And then in section 5D, it would adopt the second clause, which states, hold a public hearing at which the city council will consider adopting a final map and election sequence that will be placed on the November 2020 ballot. Does that correctly reflect your motion? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Do we have a second? Uh, the, d the details about like, sorry, you know, hold on. now we do three and two and all that stuff that we don't have to discuss that at this point no this is this this is declaring an intent and it's 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 following the provisions of the safe harbor in terms of we will have the hearings we will hire the demographer we will um, we will put on a potential maps for the community to look at and then we've stated that our intent is to put this on the ballot so it it, it doesn't adopt the exact language about the intent to transition to elections to uh, to district based elections but that's something that could change after these after the hearings happen. At any time, you could choose to adopt them, um, or put it on the ballot, or walk away. But this is to tell you your intention is to put it on the ballot. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I, I'll second that. That sounds exactly what I was trying to get to. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, let's take a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Mullen. Yes. Councilmember Wagner. Yes. Councilmember Peek? No. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Yes. Mayor Fair? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, our next item is the appointment to the Parks and Rec Recreation Commission, 7A. Uh, I am going to appoint Josh Spiegel to the Parks and Rec Commission. Thank you, Skyler. Were there any speakers on it? No, no, no okay. speaker slips. Okay, uh, item 7B. Uh, 
Uh, Mikey, this is your item. Yep. Okay. Um, this is the request of the City Council a special City Council meeting regarding homelessness. Um, I don't think I need to add a whole lot to this. Um, I'll just make this very brief. Us, the City of Malibu, and pretty much every city around us, across the state, across much of the nation, is uh, dealing with unprecedented homelessness issue. What we're doing now is definitely, in my opinion, not probably going to sustain us into the future. I think, first of all, a lot of people don't know what we're doing now. A lot of people don't understand the law around it. And um, I assume all of you are getting a lot of emails on this. It's obviously a huge concern in the city of Malibu, and I think it deserves our undivided attention for an evening to start with, including I think people in the city deserve and want the right to email us and come speak in person about their feelings on this issue. So I am asking the city council to bring forward and do a, a a special meeting on this and uh, I think you've seen letters of support and the homeless working group is certainly in support as well and that's it it's sort of like an update on what's going on and whether stuff can happen in the future yeah I think we need to talk about options and um, I think there's I think that we're coming to a place where if we continue to do what we're doing, the state may very well tell us what we're going to do next, and I think we want to avoid that at all cost, in my opinion. But my opinion can't be the one that counts here. I think it has to be a larger discussion and a larger decision. Well, I agree with you that it's a big problem, but it's, it's not like worthy. <laughs> Our problem is so bad, the state's going to come and everyone's having problems with this. But you're right. It is something we need to talk about. We need to get the whole community involved. We need to grab the bull by the horns, you know, and figure out which way we want to go on it. Well, let's do it. Let's bring it back. I don't know if we need to vote on it or if we just get consensus and you can bring it back and we can discuss it. Um, so if there's consensus to do a special meeting, we'll pull the council, uh, you know, this week to see your availability and set up a, a date. Okay. Yeah, I think, Mikey, I think it's a good idea and a good initiative. I think it's, uh, it's, this is the big, this is our new big giant grizzly bear to be wrestled in 2020. Well, and I think we all have to acknowledge there's two sides to this issue. There's the impact on all of us who live here uh, and visitors, and then there's the, um, the state of those who are homeless in this community. And it's definitely less than ideal for all sides. So, Mikey, I appreciate you bringing this item. And, um, yeah. I look forward to this council meeting, a special meeting with this item as the only agenda item. Uh, I appreciate um, everyone's support, and I want to thank Susan for all the work uh, she's been doing on this as well. And uh, there you go. Thank you. Okay. The next item, uh, our final item is 7C. And uh, Rick, that's your item. Uh, I think we got a speaker on this, right? Yeah. Do we? Okay. Did you fill out a slip? So I don't have any slips. Well, come on up anyway. Somebody's got to speak on this. We'll okay, just out a, one moment. Um, fill out a hold slip, on. Speaker slip. Uh, I, I call the slips in the order that they're uh, given to me. So um, are you Rebecca Carpenter? No. Okay. <laughs> Our fee first speaker is Rebecca Carpenter. Are you? Is that you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And then John Mazza, and then Elizabeth Howland. Oh, and is it Nathan Lake? Okay, this this was sitting separately. I think it was the bottom slip. Okay. Okay, so a little Thank intro you. here. Uh, I was contacted by David Katz of the Malibu Film Festival, uh, asking me to bring this to put it on the agenda, to uh, appeal to the city to get the fees waived for this year's Malibu Film Festival. We had a lovely conversation. We talked about a lot of different things, and I told them to come down and be ready to 
give his best case. I did my job of getting it on the agenda, and it was his job to sell it. And unfortunately, he's not feeling very well tonight, and Rebecca is pinch hitting for him. So I sincerely appreciate you coming down, Rebecca, and staying all night long <laughs> for this. So thank you for your um, dedication to the community, and you now have an open council ready to hear what you have to say. Awesome. Hi, guys. Good evening. Um, I'm a Malibu resident, been living here for 21 years, and a filmmaker, and um, have a film that I'm working on about the Woolsey fires, interviewing locals about their experiences and practices of saving their houses or everything that happened. Um, and so one of my one of them, it's a digital series, and one of the videos is in the film festival, and. Um, uh, there's also another film about the Woolsey fires and so they wanted to do a special block just for that and to have it be free to Malibu residents to kind of be informative and encouraging and healing hopefully um, and so they yeah the hope was that the the city would waive the fees to host it here at City Hall um, and also help to support local filmmakers. What's uh, obviously we're in LA County and there's a million film festivals, but the Malibu Film Festival um, is unique in that it has a lot of um, newer filmmakers. So, and all, obviously residents as well, which is pretty cool. Um, and also hopefully these films would inform and inspire people in their emergency readiness, obviously. I don't, um, but also entertain. <laughs> So that's, um, yeah, I would just ask you guys to support us, local filmmakers and, and um, residents as well. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is John Mazza, followed by Elizabeth Howland, followed by Nathan Lake. Good afternoon or evening. Um, I was on the Arts Task Force, so I'm for things like this. The one thing I wanted to point out to you and and that is that you need a policy on who you give things away to. Uh, MTC had an oil oil uh, thing here, and we brought in all kinds of speakers and everything. We had to pay, okay? So there should be some criteria, not just that Rick said, you know, let's discuss it. Now, that, but that's fine. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is this is a Santa Monica event normally. And, uh, but... <clears throat> The staff report asks for you to pay for the fees, but you're not being asked to pay for the fees. I called the city hall today, or city par uh, parks and rec today, and the fees are for this event are $2,432. If you look at your staff report, everything else of that 8,000 is labor that the city hires. So when the staff report says the city, this will result in a loss of revenue of $8,040, there's $6,000 of that loss of revenue, which is not loss of revenue, it's increase of expense. The city will be $6,000 approximate dollars poorer after this event. You're not just giving them the auditorium, you're providing uh, you're providing a guard, uh, people to set up the parking lot. You know, there's a whole string of expenses here. So I think the, the, the best way to do it is you don't really want to put on an event for somebody. You want to help them. So you waive the fees. But do you really want to hire a security guard and all this type of stuff? Uh, people directing the traffic, et cetera, as city employees? Or do you want to have the event put on their own event? And that's the real question here. How do you define, this is not a loss of income. This is an expense item. One, two thirds of it is. And I think you should consider that when you consider this. Uh, otherwise somebody may come in and say, hey, why don't you put on a circus for us? That's only an extra 40 grand because you need guys that know how to handle elephants. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is Elizabeth Howland here? Okay. Uh, Nathan Lake. Thank you. 
council members for the opportunity to speak. I'm Nathan Lake. I'm here representing the Malibu Film Festival, which was established in 1997, has been supporting and showcasing local filmmakers such as Mark and Cameron Burnett, Brian Fugel, Carson Leota, Rob Belushi, Keeley Shane Brosnan, and Pierce Brosnan, to name a few locals in addition to international filmmakers. And we currently curate quality over quantity and have gained a reputation for selecting films that are profound. Touching, visually stunning, funny, clever, or have an important message that can impact a deeper conversation or action. As a result, when a film or receives a laurel from the Malibu Film Festival, often that film goes on to Oh, to get noticed internationally for their expertise and helping them to be the best they can be. And this festival will be showcasing many Malibu filmmakers, and we invite all of you to attend and join. And in closing, we're asking for a fee waiver to continue showcasing great films to support the arts and filmmakers in Malibu. And as a, I mean, for more information, you can go to MalibuFilmFestival.com, but um, off script, this festival is not a Santa Monica Film Festival. That's the Santa Monica Film Festival. This is the Malibu Film Festival. And we've been here since 1997. And historically, this festival is funded by Malibu residents who have gone through way too much to ask for anything this year. So it is not the, you know, historically in our position that we ask for, you know, uh, a handout from the city by any means. And that's all. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Rick? Well, I was hoping that Mr. Katz might come down here and give us a little more of the why we need it, you know, which he, his emissaries told uh, how well the, um, how good the event is. And I do think that there's, uh, you know, Malibu obviously has a long history of filmmakers uh, that live here and, uh, it's a source of pride, and it's one thing that I think we should embrace as we go forward. And who knows, maybe in the future, if they get some art center or something, it'll be a little easier to put these type of things on. But neither of you really went into detail as to why, other than it's been a rough year for the residents of Malibu. But John brings up a good point, and so I wanted to ask Reeve about that. What is the fee, and what is all that labor and stuff? So um, maybe we could have explained it differently. I think we're sort of talking semantics at this point. Um, the applicant, if they were to come in and pay to have an event here, would have to pay the $8,000. Some of those costs do include staff time that we require to have here or, or, or at a facility when there's an event. Um, there is a permit fee, which would be the loss of revenue. But if the uh, council tonight were to say, we don't want to charge this applicant anything, the city would then have to pay for those uh, costs for those staff time for those staff to be present. And we do require uh, those staff, uh, the number of staff that's listed in the application um, at all of our events. So I hope, does that make sense what I'm trying to explain? But it will cost us something as we either have to get the money to pay for the staff from an applicant or pay for it out of our own pocket. So we could just say pay for the fee for the whatever. Maybe the venue fee is which would be the largest single chunk is something that we could waiver the, the actual being here and then the labor could be another cost. I, I'm just throwing it out there because of course we want to support things like this and but we can't start a new precedent and I appreciate Nathan speaking the way you did about how tough it's been here in Malibu, but I don't mind throwing the film festival a bone, but not the whole, not the whole caboodle. Um, so Riva, if I were to look at the, I guess the proposal that's in here, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I see an eight-hour block on the first page. It's five hundred eighty-six dollars, and uh, lower down I see a parking lot outdoor event. 
for $1,284. And then on the second page, I see a $923 for a 16-hour block. So are those really the expenses that are on there that are not the stuff, like the stuff that we could essentially waive the costs of? I'm going to ask Jesse to speak to that, please. Uh, good evening, Mayor, for members of City Council. Uh, yes, to answer your question, anything that, that's not noted as staff would be something that's facility related. And so uh, depending on what the event is, we'll have a certain number of staff here. This is considered a pretty large event for a reservation here at City Hall. So that's the reason for the large amount of staff and security, security personnel that, that's included in this. But yes, traditionally or historically, what the council has done has weighed facility fees and not staff fees. That's pretty typical of what the council has done. In this case, the request was for everything. So okay. I would make a motion to waive facility fees for this event. Could I ask one question before we do that? At the very end where it says payment, um, it says $1,500 refundable deposit if facility is left timely slash in good condition, oh, due by January 14th. Okay, excuse me. I'm fine. Never mind. I have a question. How much does it cost to go to the film festival? I would ask them to maybe come up and... I don't know off the top of my head either. Probably based on fixed cost. Yeah. Can you run up to the mic real quick? According to their website, it's $10 a ticket or $500 for the weekend or $50 for special showings. Is that correct, Nathan? Yeah. Can, yeah, can so it's, it's reasonable. To the mic for one sec. Thanks. I appreciate it. And is the money used for your own staff, or how does that work? It's for our own staff, yeah. So I've done the film festival here in this place, like transforming it. These, I was curious to know how these function. They're you know stacked over here. But basically, the cost associated with it, which is normally we comp, we bring in audio equipment, and we transform the room. We have a, a, a large like, projector that we use. And normally, we hire our own people. It's on a Saturday. Um, I would think that the $8,000 cost would mirror something during the week where all of staff is here, which would make sense, maybe, partially. But um, typically on a Saturday, there's maybe one or two staff, uh, a guy that comes for the audio and checks it out, you know, make sure everything's fine, and then there's nobody else here. So it's, I, I was shocked when I heard there's, staff involved at all normally it's um, you know one or one or two people so it's it, it would be awesome to just have um, any type of leniency would be great thanks 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 for clarifying thank you um, mayor if I might jump in I think what they've asked for this event uh, for this year is a larger in scale what they've done in the past and so the use of the outside part of the facility in the parking lot is a new request um, and one of the things we've learned the hard way is having um, large events with a lot of people throughout the building and the exterior without sufficient staff to make sure that our rules are complied with um, and that things are, are working smoothly so that we don't get complaints from the neighbors. Um, so it's, it's something we're pretty adamant about making sure we have the right amount of staff here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so again, I'd make a motion that we uh, approve funding the non-labor related costs, which as I outlined before, which is it looks like a rental fee for the theater, um, a rental fee from the parking can we, lot. Can we specify uh, oh, the case? Numbers? Yes. So there's a $586 civic theater charge a $1,284 parking lot outdoor event charge, and a full day setup event and cleanup 16 hour block $923 charge. The motion would be to waive those three items. Yes, waive those costs. And then, you know, if they decide to downsize the event, their costs would go down on the other stuff because they wouldn't need as much people, but the staff would figure that out. Uh, I'll second that. It seems 
like we're going to do a split split with Malibu Film Festival, which seems reasonable. Rick, do you have any opinion about that? No, Did I've I done know? my job. I brought it in front of okay. the uh, <laughs> council, and we had a robust discussion, and Thank we you. heard input from the advocates for the film festival, and I think you've come to a good compromise during the era of belt tightening all around. Okay, so we have a motion and a second? Yes. Is that correct? I, I seconded, as Skyler mentioned, the three discounted uh, benefits for the Malibu Film us. Festival. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Meeting is adjourned at 10.36 p.m.